Uh, we're talking about the fundamentals of visual analytics this afternoon, and as I was saying, one of the big challenges is this ongoing data deluge. We have multivariate, multi-source information coming um, from all different places. In 2003, the digital information accounted for 90% of all information produced. We have cases um, in places like Walmart and other companies. Transactions are over a million per hour. So how can we explore this data, analyze it, and understand it? Um, data uh, comes in lots of different forms. We have FedEx shipping more than 8.5 million packages per day. So you have these sorts of network graphs of shipping, transactions, and all sorts of different data from those. Consumers are carrying more than 1 billion Visa cards worldwide. And so how can we analyze that data? And can we find information that might be relevant and actionable in different sorts of situations. And so with this data overload, we have a huge opportunity, as Joe was talking about right now. We have all this information available in digital form, but how can we make sense of this data? And can we harness this in order to help with the decision-making process? And how do we avoid being overwhelmed by this? And so we have this nice Dilbert cartoon that John Stasco likes to show where people are getting stupider every day, relatively speaking. The complexity of the world is increasing geometrically, but our ability to learn is the same slow trickle that it's always been. So information is gushing towards our brain like a fire hose aimed at a teacup is what they're talking about here. And so how can we start understanding this information and making sense of it? And so with visualization, the goal is to take all of this data and transform it into information. And so how many terabytes of data we've collected doesn't really matter. Um, I heard Ben Schneiderman mention this once. It's how many petaflops of insight can we generate from this data. And while people may argue about that, to some extent we need to take this data and we do need to generate insight from this data. So having a lot of data does help, but how do we make actionable information about this data? And so the purpose of computing is not really insight. Um, I'm sorry, the purpose of computing is insight. It's not really numbers. And we need to make the data understandable to people and a key way of doing this is through visualization. So a nice example of this is here we've got this um, Excel table of animal brain weight and body weight. And if I want you to tell me which animal has the highest brain weight to body weight sort of proportion, you need to go and scan through all this data. And so one thing I might do is make a picture of the data to answer these questions about which animal weighs the least the most. Is there a relationship between brain weight and body weight? And if there's any outliers? So the interactive portion of this might be, where do you think humans are on this picture? There should be in the top left. So that's always the answer I get. But this graph, again, is a visualization sort of trickery here, where this was body mass in kilograms and brain in grams. So we wind up with humans here in the middle somewhere. So we wind up, humans are, are they even on my picture? <laughs> They're here somewhere. The sky, yeah. <laughs> they, they wind up here in the middle. And the reason for this winds up being because we really need to look at the log of the brain weight minus two thirds of the log of the body weight. And now we see modern man winds up in the upper right portion. So it's more of a proportionality of different things. And so we want to think about how to not necessarily lie with visualization. So when I ask you that question, I'm kind of tricking you into a sense of thinking what might be in this visualization by not having the sort of labels there originally. Um, you assume that humans are going to be in the upper right because they're the most important and should have the highest sort of brain function, but based on the data, um, we don't wind up with that simply because here is body mass in kilograms and humans don't weigh as much as elephants, for example. So, so we've had these sorts of ideas of visualization through the ages. We have these hand-drawn illustrations of water by Leonardo da Vinci in order to study flow. Um, we have John Snow's famous map of cholera cases in London. Moving on, we looked at Charles Menard, created these flow maps of Napoleon's disastrous campaign in Russia. In Russia, so you see the size of his army in the light brown on the top as it goes through its campaign until its inevitable retreat, and you see the um, shrinking of this size of the army. So this width, the width of the line here was the size of the army, and we can see what's left at the aftermath. Later on, we would start seeing visualizations being made into sort of 3D models. We had James Maxwell's thermodynamic sur um, surface sculpture, which I believe you can see at Oxford, actually. I might be wrong about that, but you can look that up in Wikipedia about where you can actually go and see this. It still exists there. And the idea here was he wanted to have his three-dimensional plot of his fictitious water-like substance in order to understand his mathematical equations of entropy and energy. So visualization is helpful because it's utilizing our high bandwidth visual system. The human mind is fast and parallel, and we're really good 
at recognizing patterns within the data. And so the goal of creating these pictures is to help us find these patterns within the data. And oftentimes we can use <coughs> perception and pre-attentive cues to help us um, understand these visual phenomena. So we think visually oftentimes, and a picture we often say is worth a thousand words. So if we can take advantage of <coughs> our visual processes, hopefully we can help understand information better. Um, ideally, visualization will help amplify cognition. So it expands our working memory. We can offload results. Um, oftentimes, you'll see this if you think about when you multiply two large numbers together. So if you want to multiply 121 by 39, it's a lot easier to do that on paper than to offload portions of your multiplication um, visually on the paper as opposed to trying to do that all in your head at once. And ideally, it'll help us with pattern detection and recognition by setting up perceptual cues and inter in inferences in our visualizations. And we want to design them to control attention and interaction for improving cognition. And so visualization um, has been defined as the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations of data to amplify cognition. And it's not so simple to create a graphic or an Im image, though. The idea is you want to create insight, not just pretty pictures. So while making a pretty picture might sometimes help you get into a visualization conference, it doesn't necessarily mean that that technique or tool is going to be adopted or used by different communities. And so we want to help people form a mental model of their image, and we want to help them internalize their own understanding and promote discovery, decision-making, and explanations. And so ideally, we want to utilize these cognitive and perceptual principles in order to create the most effective visualizations for understanding and exploring this information. And so we have different sorts of ways where we've looked at how can we utilize sorts of these hand-drawn representations? Can we use these mental models of how people give directions in order to create more effective route maps? And so using these sorts of ideas, can we come up with better ways to explain data? And this is just one example from Manish Agarwal's group. And so scientific visualization, the idea is it's going to primarily relate to and represent something physical or geometrical. And the structure of the data is typically defined or given We'll have some sort of three-dimensional grid, some sort of airflow over a wing, stresses on a girder, um, organs in the human body. And so this is where scientific visualization sorts of, sort of lies. And then information visualization oftentimes is thought of as not having uh, direct physical correspondence in the data. So you might think of social networks in a graph. Uh, the notion of the data there is abstract. So things like baseball statistics, stock trends, and those sorts of things. <coughs> But the purpose of both scientific visualization and information visualization is the analysis. We want to help you understand your data better, and then we want to help you um, act on that understanding. So if we give you a data set, you should be able to compare, contrast, assess, and evaluate the data. And ideally, you want to solve a problem with the visualization. We don't just want to make a picture of the data for the sake of making a picture. The idea is that this should help you solve something or help you gain more understanding in your data set. And so the main issue is presentation. The way you present the information to the user is going to help communicate and inform, and if we pick an effective way of communication, then it will help you more effectively understand your data. And so visualization oftentimes is thought of as useful in exploratory data analysis, and in fact, Tookie has a whole book on exploratory data analysis using statistical graphics. And then Schneiderman has his information-seeking mantra where he says, with our data, we want to first present an overview of the data, and then zoom and filter and then details on demand of the data. So in the tasks for visualization then, we can search and browse the data, find a specific piece of information, and then inspect that for different cues. We want to analyze the data to do comparisons between different chunks of the data, look for outliers, extrema, and patterns, and then we want to monitor things. We want to look for changes within the data. So we have these three sorts of <coughs> major tasks that we often are doing with our data sets. And ideally, what we'll do is that contained within the data of any investigation is information. And Cleveland sums this up very well in a quote. And so with this information, yes, we are monitoring the data. We're looking for trends. We're looking for outliers. And we're sort of playing this data detective role through this exploratory data analysis. But visualization by itself is not necessarily the total solution. This is why we are talking here today about visual analytics. Traditional visualization misses several key factors in how people solve difficult problems. And visual analytics, the idea is that we want to overcome these shortfalls and create this interactive human-computer exploration and decision-making environment. 
So we combine these cognitive and perceptual principles with visualization, with um, interaction, and with analytics, creating this sort of visual analytics group. And so visual analytics is um, such we have visualization is good for exploring data, but we can do more than just explore. Visual analytics, as stated in Thomas and Cook's Illuminating the Path, is the science of analytical reasoning facilitated by interactive visual interfaces. And we got key words there that we haven't talked about before when we mentioned visualization and scientific visualization, but interactive is one of the key words. How do we interact with the data? <laughs> Furthermore, we also want to combine automated analysis techniques with these interactive visualizations in order to create an effective understanding of the data. We need to have these analyses to help us pick out what's important with the data and help show those to people. And a graphic display has many purposes, but it achieves its highest value when it forces us to see what we're not expecting. And so we always have the tagline from visual analytics of detect the expected and discover the unexpected. And so this kind of gives us the foundations of visual analytics, and I'll turn it over to David to talk about these sorts of things. And what probably would have been a really good outing would have been to go and visit the plaque where John, where the pump was that John Snow mm -hmm. traced the cholera outbreak to. Would have been fun to do. But um, so maybe next time we're on your way out of the city. Uh, so um, with this, uh, you know, the, I. We just added this from in for the reference about, you know, aren't you missing the cognitive science? Because when I, it's something that uh, most of the people who talk about visual analytics always think of is that it's this quite multidisciplinary in its foundations, and that's a key role. And the question relating to art, there's been a lot of work in effective communication of information by designers and illustrators for decades and bringing that whole science in which is why Brian's at a school of interactive art and technologies where he's got more design students than computer science students, right? So, you know, there is this multidisciplinary science to trying to come up with it. And so now that you've had a bit of a background, um, I think it's, you know, useful before we get into the fundamentals of how to use a lot of these techniques is to show some example applications. And that's what I'm going to go through now and since we had the great example of Jon Snow um, and the cholera outbreak, we're going to talk about a little more modern work in terms of public health visual analytics. And um, a lot of work that's going on now really is involved with to try to see how you can find unusual health events. Syndromic surveillance really is trying to get accurate and early determination of when you have an unusual event that occurs. And you're trying to use information that's readily available. You can actually go to Google Health Maps if you want to see some information. There's a lot of fundamental problems with Google Health Maps, for instance, if you say that this outbreak is similar to the Cincinnati outbreak of 1953, then Cincinnati also now is cited as an occurrence of that. And so the common thing that people tend to use, though, is um, in the US, and I'm not sure it would work as well in the UK, um, emergency department chief complaints, because in the US uh, emergency departments provide health care to everyone who can't afford health insurance. So it's a really good statistical sampling of the population when we're extending the work to Pakistan and looking for disease surveillance there. We can no longer use hospital data to get an accurate indication of general conditions in the population. It can be used for some serious conditions, but most people would never go to the hospital. There's also the idea of using over-the-counter drug sales. If people go and buy Tylenol or they buy cold medicine, well, that gave me an indication quicker. If you work with the people who develop the database, they claim it will. If you're someone else who's using the data, they've never found it to really be effective once they don't collaborate with the people at the University of Pittsburgh. And most people, after they've had a serious illness, probably never want to let their medicine cabinet get to the point that when they get sick, they're running to the drugstore. Um, so it, it depends. That is really good at helping you find when all the drugstores have sales. Um, so, you, <laughs> you know, and, and then you can look at the ProMed database where um, medical researchers around the world provide information. You can look at a lot of different sources of information for this. You can look at absenteeism 
from employers or absenteeism from schools to try to bring that in. The problem is, as was mentioned, there's all these sources of data, but in bringing the sources of data together, there's a huge cost of integrating them. And there's a cost of getting online monitoring going. And does it help you? Does it give you any more valuable information than what you had before is always the key there. And so here's an example of looking at syndromic surveillance of health complaints where you're taking the keywords, you're applying a classifier based on human knowledge to categorize them into one of eight different categories, then providing the um, actual graphs from that information. You can then map it on, interactively explore what's going on there. Yeah, and when I saw Karachi in Lebanon come up, this was, there's going to be a talk by Joe Wood talking about issues and problems and what they've learned from the vast challenge data set. And after we applied our techniques to this, we thought that it could have been some of Ross's synthetic disease generation software that they actually used to generate it because we were easily able to pull out the signals from it. Um, so when you make that stuff available, it's nice that people actually use it. Um, but we had developed this work with working with the Indiana, Indiana State Department of Health where they were trying to get a better idea of what was going on because the state of the art um, software, and I'm going to blank what does that mean? Essence, yeah, I always remember Fez, which is an Indiana one. Um, Essence, that's used by most of the health departments, it has a very high false positive rate. The goal is not to miss a positive. So when the state epidemiologist would look, come in during the day, he would have 120 unusual alerts, and he'd get a ranked list by T value. And he's got to go through and figure out which one of those do I investigate today because each one takes me a half an hour to an hour to investigate to decide whether it was really something. And so that's a huge false positive rate. He can go through maybe 10 a day. So can you create something where he can find patterns and explore them more quickly and interactively to understand the problem? And so that was some work that Ross developed here where you've got the map of the state of Indiana with hotspots where you're adapting the um, hot spots based on the underlying density of the population, so the large cities always don't appear to be the hot locations. You've got the fact that you can choose the area of aggregation and the increment to move through a long time. You've got the, you can look at the different displays for individual hospital data, selected region data, and the State Department of Health versus specific clinics. You've got a keyword, um, basically SQL query generator here over at the side so that the epidemiologist doesn't have to do MySQL queries and they can go and choose conditions that they may want to look at. So here if you look at influenza-like illness, you can go through and explore and choose. You can choose gastrointestinal, see a hotspot, pull it up to investigate it, find that there was an alert generated from your control charting methods. You can pull up the individual hospital and see that there was no unusual occurrences at that hospital was no higher than you expected, and you can explore further to see what specifically caused that alert. And what caused the alert was the fact that you had one patient come in who came to the emergency department when you expected zero. Probably not a serious health problem. So these are the type of things that you can quickly rule that out as not statistically significant, nothing to worry about, let's go on to the next one. So within a couple minutes you can do this and prioritize what you're looking at. And the reason that this works, what this also involved, is new techniques for pulling out um, patterns in data and getting a good baseline so you can get better prediction. So by doing seasonal trend decomposition based on lowest smoothing, which is locally weighted smoothing of scatter plots, you can actually find, you can build up a signal and a predictive signal of the seasonal trend, day of week trend, monthly trends, and then you get the remainder from that. And that remainder signal, you can then go ahead and apply your anomaly detection to and reduce the false positive rate. So by building this, I think of it as a statistical equivalent of the information theory on Fourier analysis, breaking things down to their fundamental components so that you can build up the predicted signal from it. It has a much fewer false positives than the early aberration reporting system, which is the standard used in disease surveillance, and it tends to work pretty well for other type of data that we've tried. And 
Um, it works really well for crime data as well as health data. But now there are people who are doing um, epidemiological criminology as a field of research because they think that crime spread and crime patterns are similar to disease patterns. So maybe that's why it works for those things just as well. But that's an emerging new field. But here's a case where once you build that up with six months of data, you can get a predictive model where you have your error bounds, and by using six months of historical data, you can be within a 95% confidence interval for 13 days into the future pretty accurately. So that's good for staffing, right? It also lets you know what should you expect if you're a hospital manager. And that's a real goal as you're trying to integrate these data sources together and get people to take the time to contribute them and validate them is how can you use private data and public data and both get benefit from it. In the U.S., it's called public health information exchanges of using public health data that's collected by the government with private practice and developing a system where the private um, practice personnel can also get a better idea of what's going on in their community so they can do better practice management. That gives them motivation then to give the data back to the state who can give them more information and get an overall view of things. And so it's this sort of growing um, wealth of information and data sources. When we started doing that work, one of the things that came up is, well, now that you have an idea of what's going on, what if you explore courses of action or take measures? Can you actually see the results of doing that? And so by integrating interactive simulation models based on, in this case, for many diseases, it's very easy to come up with a distribution model based on person-to-person -person transfer or mosquito transfer etc. so that you can have an interactive simulation running at the back end. And so you can decide to take action and see the results of your action. The problem with that is the response is not always what's expected. And the pandemic example I'll show next, I should have switched those around. You can, whenever you take action, the earlier you take action, the better. You tell people there's a pandemic, they should wash their hands, they should stay home more. You close schools, you give out antivirals, it all decreases the spread of the pandemic. So the earlier you take action, the better. And it's an easy model to look at. But in mosquito-borne illnesses, you can actually make problems worse by taking action. It's just like cancer treatment. If you don't get all of the cancer cells, um, then it comes back and it can actually spread to more places than if it had been concentrated in one location. So this is a case of taking action can make the problem worse. So we allow people not only to have the spatial temporal view, but also to see the cumulative effect of their decisions and try to look at multiple passes. So if they decide to spray in certain counties in one day for a mosquito-borne illness, and then they put in quarantines on another day, what is the cumulative effect? And have they made things better or worse? And um, this is a great um, Rift Valley fever that's spread by the um, 80s and Culex mosquitoes is a great example that most of the actions that you take will actually make things worse. So for the visualization side, it's great to show the complexity of the problem and why you really need a tool to understand um, what the consequence of your decision. So this is sort of going from where Joe's talking about presentation and decision making to can you take action, can you compare alternatives, can you look at what's going to happen into the future there and trying to bring some of that into play. And so with the pandemic, it's easy to see, to develop a model and look at it. And um, you can then go on to other areas in public health. You can also then take that on to other areas of public safety, which I'll talk about now, in terms of looking at responses to emergency situations. Joe talked about the amount of data sources that are available today. And then, you know, the goal is always what information is relevant, how do we allow someone to interact that with that data in a natural format. Can they easily understand it? Not to give them more and more data, but to give them the relevant pieces of data and come up with a natural update frequency as well so that you don't get paralysis by analysis of real-time streaming data coming in and thinking the next piece of information will make me more confident to take action. So you really need to look at the whole process of emergency response. Most people just talk about how can I detect what's going on, how do I increase situational awareness, but can you actually use this in the planning stage to develop a more resilient 
um, un infrastructure for that? Can you do training? Can you then do better detection? Can you do response? Can you do um, remediation and recovery after it? These are all facts of the whole life cycle. And visual analytics can really help for most of those things. Because you've got the trend analysis, anomaly detection, you've got integrated models to allow you to see the consequences. You can bring in different sources of data. So if you have a chemical spill and you need to think about the chemicals that are used and then billing the people who the trucker, who trucking company that had the truck that spilled because the state won't pay for it, can you hook all of that into the system and see what the re capabilities are going to be for that? And so that's why you can think of the you know, most common thing people, though, talk about is, can I get better situational awareness? Can I really understand what's going on more effectively so I can make um, better decisions? And as you'll probably see, I would assume, when you're talking about document analysis for intelligence analysis, there's this old, relatively old study, I think 1995, oh, 2005 by Parole and Card. Should be, I thought it was earlier than that. Might be 1995. 1995. Yeah. Uh, that date's wrong, sorry, um, of actually how analysts gather information, they sort of create these shoe boxes, they get their evidence file, then they go and try to make sense of it, come up with a hypothesis, go back and gather more information, and then go and present it at the end. In situational awareness, you have Ensley's model of levels of situational awareness, and you can start to correlate these things into how it is an analytical process and getting that from perceiving the elements to the comprehension to the projection of what may happen in the future and the course of action that you're going to take for that. So integrating many different fields, and that's the great thing about trying to do something multidisciplinarily, if that's a word. <laughs> I it didn't, actually didn't get tongue-tied, which uh, I don't think I've ever said that before. Um, but if you use these different things, can you get the best practices and the understanding from all those different fields instead of just looking at it from the intelligence side? How can you look at it from the situational assessment and understanding side of things and see what people have learned to make this better? So not only do we have the fact of how do you allow people to do this and pull the right information in, how do you handle command center situations? How do you handle in-field experiences. Can people work in the field and get things on a mobile device in a smoke-filled environment and read it or out in bright sunlight when you can't see it? What are the type of things that come into play? How can you bring in models that will give them an idea of the action that they're able to take and see how that integrates together? Can we use the new sources of information that are out there in social media and pull that in in real time and help them find anomalies and correlate the different temporal characteristics of those structures. These are all really challenging problems and when is that relevant? Right? That's always the question is does it help someone make a decision and I'll give some examples of issues for that. So there are types of things that you can bring in but again there's a cost when you give people more information. You don't want to overload them cognitively so that they can't make the decision. So I'm going to show some examples for public safety of work that we've been doing talking about predictive analytics, risk-based um, visualization and analysis, trying to bring in some uncertainty visualization into this, looking at the consequences of action, allowing you to look over different time periods of data to make your decisions and integrate in multiple sources of data. So we've been very fortunate um, with the work that we've done and as was mentioned by Joe, a great practice is to start with end users and the problems they're trying to solve. And I'm a, I've been for a long time a firm believer in application-driven research of extending the state of the art more quickly because the real world's messier than I could have ever imagined whenever I go into a new domain. Um, and I have a real appreciation for why weather forecasting is so inaccurate given the um, work we do in cloud physics visualization and weather visualization now that I understand more of what's going on and how little of the problems known. But you find that in everything. So when we're looking at this, what we're, we have a great partnership with the United States Coast Guard who's trying to understand their missions. What are the risks? They actually have a sort of systemic model of risk in every action that they take. 
which I've never seen in any other organization. Now, the risk models might not be very good, but, but they do everything based on risk-based decision making. Before they go out and launch a boat, they go through a series of questions and do a green, amber, red um, rating. They come up with numbers for the severity of each of the conditions, and they come up with an overall number. If it's not green, they have to say, if it's amber, do I make, take some action to, before deciding to go out? If it's red, they have to go back to the, uh, up the chain of command to say, should we still launch the boat? And I know going out with them, the fact that we had never been on a Coast Guard boat before raised some of the level because you've got people who don't know what they're doing that might get in the way or when they say engines up and the boat goes up at a 40 degree angle may fall off the back, these type of things they need to be prepared for. So all of these things come into play, but they do that throughout the entire process. So that's a great challenge. How do people understand and analyze risk? So we started working with them with a simple sort of the primary reason that the Coast Guard exists is to aid boaters, search and rescue. Can they help people in distress? What are the problems that they have with that? What are the characteristics of where do incidents occur? What's happening with their staffing? What's happening with budgets? Budgets um, probably around, well, in Europe, in the US, for most agencies and most companies are doing nothing but decreasing. Right? So in a shrinking budget, how do you maintain safety is one of the questions they're dealing with. They also have the fact that volunteers, they do a lot of volunteers to help in this mission and the generation of volunteerism in the U.S. has sort of gone away. Current generation of people are getting to, towards retirement age no longer think they feel this sense of duty and volunteerism. And so they're losing a lot of their personnel. So what does this mean? They want to know what is the situation, what can we do, what's the effect if we're going to have to move boats around or close stations. So they came up with this problem, and we developed a system for them where, oops, I thought this was interactive, I want to explain it, where you have a calendar view here over at the side. You can see the day of week variation of the um, search and rescue missions. You can see it week by week here. The first thing that this sort of shows you, if you look at that, is that there's large periods where there's very few cases and there's this big bulge in the middle where there's a lot of cases and this is actually data from the Great Lakes in the U.S. and those are the summer months um, when things are below zero Celsius, people don't tend to go out in the water too much and the lakes do freeze, not as much as they did 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but you have this very strong seasonality and you see that in the temporal display here where you can see the yearly oscillation. You also see a general decrease in cases over time. And you might say, well, why are they decreasing? You can look at it by different zones. You can search and select the different data that you want to visualize and then you see the density heat map of where things are occurring. And so you, one of the things you can look at instead of what are the cases, you can look at the risk. There's risk measures associated with every incident based on risk index numbers that the U.S. government has identified for value of lives and different things. And so you can see places where there's a lot of risk. You have hot spots occurring here near Cleveland. You have a hot spot occurring up here at the end of the lake and some of these hot spots, you get a hot spot here in Detroit um, related to deaths from people jumping off of a bridge where the Coast Guard taking action really would have no effect because jumpers off of bridges are normally dead by the time, well, within a few seconds after they hit the water. So um, a Coast Guard being on scene in 30 minutes or two hours makes no difference. So there's also the question of total risk versus mitigated risk versus potentially mitigated risk and then what's the residual risk left, and can you actually take an effect of that? So there's three or four different risk measures we're visualizing. You can look at it from the other aspect of saying, where are the areas of highest risk based on how long it's going to take the Coast Guard to get there? The longer if you have, the longer time it takes them on scene, the higher risk when you're doing boating operations. So you may be interested in knowing that you probably don't want to be out in this area. Although the other thing that you find out here is you, have an issue of only half of some of the Great Lakes have any data because of the international boundary with Canada and the data is not shared <laughs> across the two. So this blue area is the safe area because you can assume that the Canadian Coast Guard will come to your rescue. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that they've been looking at, so they had to start looking at that in the impact of closing stations and what would that do to those response ranks. 
But another thing they said is, well, this all these stations were created in 1915. The map of the boat rescue service stations in 1915 when the Coast Guard was created to today are almost identical. Now, they were going out in very large rowboats in 1915. They've got a little better capability now. Where might you have um, or inefficiencies, redundancy of coverage? And so we've actually created maps showing areas where one station can respond. The light blue is two stations. This color is three stations. You see there's large areas where three and four stations can all be there within 90 minutes, which is what they think is a safe interval. And so you might say, we've got too many stations covering this. Maybe you want two stations to be able to respond in case they happen to occur at the same time, but three stations, four stations, probably not very efficient. This is current asset allocation. If you change it to one potential scenario of allocating the new generation of boats that come out, you see there's very large areas where there's even more coverage. And so you could make the argument that, well, we should we don't need all those stations there. Let's look at the effect of closing these, which you can interactively do if I ran the software and showed you what the response, the change in the response rings would be. There's information you don't know, though, that comes into play for this. First of all, there's politics. Closing a state Coast Guard station, I'm told, is like closing a neighborhood fire station. People don't seem to get as upset about closing a police station. Um, but I'm told no one wants a fire station in their neighborhood closed, and no one wants a Coast Guard station closed, even if you can say people safety won't be changed. There's also the fact that in some communities in the U.S. we have volunteer um, fire departments and volunteer emergency management personnel. And in some communities, the small communities, the Coast Guard personnel who are stationed there actually can be the majority of that force. So if you go ahead and close the station while well, for the safety in the water it might be fine, the community may fact suffer other things. And how would you decide that that's relevant information and find that information? Um, so that's one of those cases where I'd say, I don't know that visual analytics can always tell you what you don't know and what's relevant. But that's a discussion to have. Um, which, but when Joe was mentioning that this morning, it made me think of that. And then you can look at what's the cost of the operations that we do and say, should we be doing all these things? Are there some things that we respond to that's really a huge expense, and maybe we shouldn't be doing it anymore? Here's an example of looking, selecting a region, looking at the cost of cases where you went out and never found anyone in the water when you saw um, a certain type of initiation. And you can see that hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent on this one type of case. And you might say, should we make a policy change because we're spending too much money with very little payoff for this. So that gets into the whole business side of the safety aspect of what people are doing. And that's become more important given the world economy today. So it's, changed the way, it's changing the way people look at that. So you can start bringing all of that together and then try to combine those type of financial decisions in with the thing of looking at, as I said, total risk versus mitigated risk. You can look at is there, are there correlations between different things that you do? As you increase hours that you're out in the water, does risk decrease? You know, you would hope that that would that sort of be the underlying um, principle, but you can see cases where the number of boating hours doesn't decrease the number of incidents. And I find the same thing in talking with a state highway patrol in the U.S. that they're interested. They've never looked to see if they increase uh, frequency of officers going past an area does the number of accidents decrease. That's their hypothesis, especially in holidays that the bigger presence they have, the safer driving will be, but they haven't looked at that. So it's all this data and you can start act, asking these things. And so that's one type of thing where we're really trying to bring in financial implications of decision making. We're trying to bring in alternatives and models of what happens when you re reallocate resources and look at ways of helping people understand risk and do risk-based decision-making in terms of all of this. Another area we've looked at has been, um, which we actually started looking at first, was looking at taking the, what we had done for public health syndromic surveillance, applying it to crime. 
because there's a lot of interesting things in terms of information available to police officers today, and you've got many different missions there. You've got sort of the head of the division who's trying to justify. He tells the um, local council that he's going to take this campaign this year and spend his money this way to make the community safer. At the end of the year, he has to say, has that happened? Now, how does he show the value and convey with visualization the impact of the decisions that he made? Then you've got the long-term analysts looking at patterns and trends and trying to start stop large-scale operations. Then you've got the officer who gets a call who's responding to an incident. What information can you provide him to make him more situationally aware so that he can actually be more prepared when he knocks on that door? Or as he's patrolling, provide relevant information of what's been going on so that he can find something that he otherwise wouldn't find. So there's a lot of different tasks and a lot of different people, and they're doing different things. I mean, the person in the field, we I can run the... Um, I can run our, this software for you on my iPhone. I, the connection's good enough right now. Um, I just checked it um, during the break that I can show you crime in West Lafayette, Indiana, and allow you to scroll through it and see it. And you know, when you're doing that while you're driving 90 miles an hour to a crime scene, are you going to make sure that the person isn't distracted to get information? I'm told that there could potentially be a number of accidents that occur when officers are typing into their electronic data terminals while they're responding lights and sirens to get more information about the scene that they're going to. Um, I don't have any hard evidence for that, but um, conversations have indicated that it's a, it occurs occasionally. And um, so that's the problem. People are trying to get that information because they're trying to do their job more effectively. So we work on creating these different types of environments, and that's why you'll see our desktop versus our mobile displays look quite different. And the difference that we take, and I guess that's sort of the whole approach with visual analytics, you know, geographical information systems, commercial mapping software has been out there for a long time. I'm assuming ArcGIS is pretty much Esri's worldwide in their yeah. influence. Since 1980. I mean, the, in the US, every, pretty much every city, every state, Every federal agency all uses ArcView software, and they all have licenses, and it has great um, geospatial analytical capabilities. Time is a second-class citizen. You want to go ahead and look at yesterday versus today, you generate a new map. Change the levels of aggregation, interactively explore, generate new things, and bring it in. It's a complicated process because it was originally mapping software. Take this data in multiple layers, lay it on top of each other, and visualize it. And so we're trying to take it from the approach of how, what is someone trying to do with that and how can we interactively do it, which has actually caused some problems from some of the projects we're working on because we aren't doing things using commercial standards because they don't do what we want. Um, but that's the nice thing about having research funding is we sometimes get flexibility to do that. But how can we bring all these components in to help people do their job more effectively? And here's a case of looking at crime in West Lafayette, Indiana. In Lafayette, Indiana, we're divided by a river. And so it's actually, we've got um, four different police offices. We have Lafayette, West Lafayette, Purdue University has its own police force, and then the county sheriffs. And they all have their data integrated, but now they don't know what to do with it to figure out how to become more effective in what they do. And that's where they came to us. So you can look at the... Um, Spatial temporal heat maps, you can see the time series view. You can actually go and look at the calendar view. You can choose to see a um, time-based visualization of when they occurred. And you can see real-time anomaly detection from Twitter feeds integrated into this to see what occurred at similar times for that or at the current time. So it also has in there then the ability from what I described before with a uh, time series decomposition based on lowest smoothing to do prediction into the future so that you can actually see what the predicted values are for this. And as some, I'll show you a couple examples that were sort of interesting. This one is actually using public information on drunkenness and public intoxication combined with emergency runs for um, alcohol-related incidences 
combined with violations in residence halls at the university. So they're trying to understand when are students engaged in high-risk drinking behavior. And it also has all the locations that are licensed establishments to sell liquor to try to understand the patterns. And the first thing you notice is that there tends to be a strong day of the week effect. You also will see that their animation didn't work, but um, you can see that these the football games tend to indicate a lot of the um, incidents where, but whether the team won or lost doesn't really seem to play an impact <laughs> as to whether the drinking behavior, it's more how big of a game it was, how important. And, um, the other thing is in the college football season, there's a weekend where a team doesn't play. They have one week where they don't play. And there's actually a lot of drinking that weekend because all the fraternities and sororities have their semester celebration that weekend because they aren't competing with the football games. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they would have assumed that that was going on. But you can try to look at this, and it's surprisingly, the away games have not quite as much, but a lot of the drinking behavior. And um, so this was actually done because they're trying to see, can they do campaigns to stop students from doing things where they are getting violently ill from drinking? They're breaking the law, they're being hospitalized, and in a few cases you have deaths from binge drinking. So they're trying to understand the behavior. I guess not surprising, most of the occurrences for the calls do occur after midnight to about 3 a.m. So some things you would actually know. The thing that was most interesting to me is the people who tend to get arrested on football weekends are alumni from five, who have graduated five to ten years ago because they forget where the police tend to hang out. They're driving cars now instead of living on campus. They come back and try to live their college days. And they're the ones. Um, that's what the police have been telling me about that. But, you know, in terms of doing this, one of the things they've asked us is, you know, we're trying to see can we correlate and find patterns against different types of data. And that really is a case of when you look at data aggregated, you might find a lot of statistical correlations that have no relationship to anything that might lead to a causal factor. When something is correlated, people always want to think there's causation. But it's just, you know, a statistical test to tell you this. But you also may find that at the aggregate, there are your miss patterns because you've got the noisiness of unusual patterns in different you're sort of sampling a non-homogeneous system and looking for this. So we're actually trying to see if we can come up with natural ways to allow you to correlate at the appropriate level of granularity. And so here's an example. If you look at drug abuse violations versus burglaries, if you look at the entire county, you don't see a correlation among them. If you take a given hotspot of activity where you have a lot of drug violations and you look at burglaries in the area, you can see that there's a very strong correlation locally. And you can actually look at the lag between the correlation for this. And the thing that was surprising is that 11, while there's um, within a day a high correlation, after 11 days of a drug arrest, of a high incidence of drug arrest, you also see an increase in burglaries 11 days later. And the police officers are interested in checking if that's when people make bail, um, that they're, they're finally getting out, and so they're robbing again so they can go and buy the drugs. But um, they haven't really come up with a causation for that. But those are the type of things that you really need these interactive tools to allow people to apply their domain knowledge to where they think a hypothesis might occur, and what are the regions that may be correlated or the time scales that may be correlated. And as I mentioned, we are doing real-time um, analysis of Twitter feeds where we do the STL decomposition to find anomalies for we have something that's really you could call it the spring drinking weekend and we have a Grand Prix race that occurs on campus and um, it's the main activity in the spring where people go out and drinking there's something called the breakfast club where bars open for that weekend and on football Saturdays at 6 a.m for people to go out drinking, all the students dress up in costumes, most of them never make it to the game. And so when you look at the Twitter feeds, you do actually see breakfast come out, you do see game come out, you see a lot of things that you would expect as an anomaly related to the given topic. You can do the same thing related to the earthquake that occurred in the eastern U.S. last summer, 
that anomaly detection, it wasn't the most popular tweet that was going on, but with anomaly detection, it pops up highly. When you correlate multiple signals, you have to look at the temporal characteristics of Twitter, Flickr, and YouTube and the delays. And we're trying to develop the algorithms to actually allow you to correlate the different signals coming between the three so that you can use them. And, you know, YouTube is not going to be good for real-time crisis management of a short event. Something that lasts for days, it's very good, but there is a lag with the harvester and people posting the videos, etc. So that's what we're exploring. How can you put all that together? We have it running on the mobile devices, as I said, where we're presenting it differently, allowing you to see locally based and temporally locally related things. We have interactive plume modeling hooked in, so if there's a chemical release, you can pull in real-time wind information, see the areas that are affected, pull up the census information, tell you how many people are going to need to be evacuated in that. You can do the traditional text analysis for um, crime and intelligence analysis, such as the jigsaw system. You'll see sort of Inspire and I2 that you'll get a chance to play with are different ways of trying to solve this problem. We're actually, um, John Stasco developed Jigsaw. We're deploying it to a number of police departments. It's currently being used on three cold case homicides in our county. And then, you know, we do look at different signals to bring in. For the crime analytics, one thing is gang graffiti, understanding gang patterns, interpreting the language that's there, finding relationships between the crime signals and the gang activities, and seeing if you can let someone who's a non-gang graffiti expert actually get information from the collective knowledge of the um, gang experts in the annotated database. And so we have about 60 police officers and 600 images from 22 departments in the state of Indiana right now who are using this. We're limiting it to Indiana so that we can maintain control and validate the law enforcement identity of the officers because except for the FBI who sometimes start figuring out how to get the FBI to validate that someone is a law enforcement agent, we haven't figured out. Otherwise, it's a state registry. And we only want this tool in the hands of law enforcement. So we're um, doing it through our state police and limiting it to Indiana. But we get Port Washington, the sheriff of Port Washington, which I'm not even sure what state that's in or how many of the, them, how many Port Washingtons there are in the U.S. Um, sent mail on Thursday or Friday while I was in transit asking for a copy of the software. So we've gotten information from people across the country who wanted and hopefully we'll be able to look at transitioning to a national market at some point. But that's one of the challenges is how do you transition this technology out to the 80,000 law enforcement agencies in the U.S. and then even more when you go around the globe. But the U.S. is unusual in that you've got so many independent small agencies. And I know in Wales, or was it in the U.K., there's five police departments? I'm trying to remember from that meeting that we had. It's probably about 37 police services across the U.K. Okay, so yeah, so Wales, maybe there were a total of five, yeah. And so it's much smaller as compared to 80,000. So it's a little, it makes the problem a little bit easier, so yeah. So let me just end by, you know, just highlighting some of the issues that are common across all of this before we go to lunch is that you're trying to fuse the information from all these different data sources. You're trying to really say how can we make that information useful and what's relevant and how do we present it in an understandable manner that matches the mental model that the person has. So what is the natural scale for the problem? How do we make sure that people do their jobs more effectively and not cause them to burn out by trying to? You know, if someone's used to quick reaction on a lot of physical things and now you're expecting them to be typing at a keyboard and doing things that can be quite taxing to make that switch and we don't want to do that for people in those type of environments. And having someone who works with me who is a former state policeman who's a terrible typist. Um, I know he, you know, his view is if you have to enter, if you have to click more than one or two buttons on an iPhone, they're going to drop it and call their radio and get the information that they need. And so you've got to really understand the end user to make these useful. And so that just gives you some high-level idea of some application systems to motivate 
the development of the techniques and the science that you'll see for the analytical techniques behind it after lunch. Right. And if you're wondering why the slides aren't in your packet, because some of these slides were put in later. So after lunch, they'll start matching up again. So I saw people looking confused. So. All right. So, um, so this morning we talked about um, an introduction to visualization, um, what visualization and visual analytics entail. And we showed some examples of different systems that we've built over the time, um, over the last, what, five or so years for different applications and projects. And we had some questions during break about what, how do you decide to do different design modalities and these sorts of things. And so the things we want to talk about for the rest of our two hours today are more exactly what goes into there. And a lot of this came from what, what are things that I wish I would have known a little bit more about as I was starting out with some of these things. So the first thing I want to talk about is really data models reductions and visual representations. And so with our visual analytics programs, we have these data models, and these are simply structured forms of data that are suitable for computer-based transformation. So you can think of these as your CSV files, your SQL files. And so I've got this data in some sort of structured form. Even if it's unstructured data, I have it in some way in a database. I may have an unstructured text field in my database, and I may want to transform that, but I have some sort of structure to my data in the database. And these structures are either um, in the original data, or as I said, if I have unstructured text, I can derive a structure from that by looking for certain aspects and applying certain an um, analyses to those. And ideally, these structures are going to retain information about my data. So if I give you geographical information about your data, it should have a place, a location, um, a type maybe, some sort of descriptor about what was going on with that event. And then I can transform these into lower dimensional representations for visualization and analysis. And so data models are mathematical abstractions, and I can do numerical operations, so I can add and subtract different data components. And conceptual models are our mental models. So these are our semantic structures. They're going to support our reasoning. So you can think of this as giving directions to somebody, giving them landmarks. So how do we get to um, Hendon Hall, for example, from here? You may give me landmarks about different things to pass, or how you might get to Big Ben in London. You might tell me certain landmarks that I need to pass walking there. And this leads then to different sorts of data types. And so this is really where we can start thinking about how we want to encode our data visually. And so we have four different data types based on Stevens' um, scale of measurements from 1946. And while there's lots of arguments about the appropriate scales of measurement, this is a good place to start. And so we have four different <laughs> categories of data, and the first will be nominal. And we can describe nominal data as data whose categories have no implied ordering. So for example, I could take a poll of everybody's name in the room, and we could put that data on the board. And there's no ordering between my name and someone else's name. Now we can imply ordering through alphabetizing names or other sorts of things, but implicitly that data has no order. Um, my name is no greater than anybody else's name in terms of just, it's just a name. Now with ordinal data, this has a specified order, but it may not have a specified distance in between different sizes. So for example, um, a small cup at McDonald's may be 12 ounces, a medium may be 16, but a large may be 32. And so I know that they're bigger, but there's no specified difference, no specified distance between those sorts of things. Interval has data that has measurable distances. Um, examples would be periods of time, and the zero point here is arbitrary. And with ratio data, it's the same as interval, except now the zero point is defined. So for example, we have the Celsius scale, the height above sea level, so we're defining zero at some known base point. And from there, we can start thinking about how we can in integrate this data into the visual analytics pipeline. And so often in the visual analytics pipeline, we'll get these sorts of cyclical structures where we're doing some sort of modeling um, and analysis of the data and maybe some sort of simulation. And these feed to our interactive visual um, analytics interface. And then this goes to some decision maker, some analyst, whatever you want to call this end user, that's then in as part of the cycle as the human in the loop analyzing this data. And they may be even touching the data and modifying things in the relational database to save changes to the data, save their analyses, and save their simulations. And what we want to do is we want to take these different data types that I talked about. We have these four different data types, and we want to map them to an appropriate visual representation. So in the loop, we have data analysis where the data are prepared for visualization, so we can smooth the data, interpolate them, transform them. Then we have the filtering where we have a subset of the data, usually um, user-defined. So we talked about Ben Schneiderman's information mantra. So you had um, overview, filter, details on demand. So you're looking for a subset of the data. 
the mapping of the data, we want to map them to geometric primitives and their attributes, so mapping them to symbols on a map, colors on a picture, those sorts of things. And then we render the data where we take the geometric data and we transform them into our final image data. And so the visual representations are simply going to transform our data into a visible form, and then we want to pick visual representations that are going to highlight particularly important pieces of information or interesting pieces based on maybe what the underlying questions are by the analyst or maybe based on what the underlying machine learning techniques might have told us to begin with. And these visual representations ideally want to make it easier for the user to perceive the salient features of their data. And they're going to augment our cognitive reasoning process with perceptual reasoning and that's going to then enhance the analytical reasoning process. And we, I saw on the schedule you're going to have talks specifically on perceptual reasoning and cognitive reasoning later and we'll talk about a few of those things, but you need to think about how all of these are going to connect later on. And so I talked about how we have these four data categories and then how we're going to map these to some sort of visual attribute. And Bertan in 67 in his Semiology of Graphics provided us with sort of seven visual variables. And this sort of accounts for how we can exactly map different features to different things. We can map things based on their position on the screen. We can map data attributes based on size. So you imagine if you draw a circle for each person in the room, you could change the size based on something like length of their name or how tall they are. Uh, we could also color people's circles. If we again mapped everyone in the room as a circle, we could change the circle based on color. So we could assign a color based on your height, um, weight, whatever you wanted to look at. We could give the circle a texture. We could orient different glyphs, so instead of using a circle, you could use some sort of orientable shape. And then you could also vary the shape as well. So we get these sorts of seven visual variables that we can use to encode data. And Wilkinson in his Grammar of Graphics provides us with sort of a, a longer form version of this where he looks at the different features of texture with granularity, pattern, orientation. He even looks at optics such as blur and transparency and different features about size, shape, and rotation. And so these are sort of limiting us to how many sorts of things we can show in our data. So if I only get seven visual features, then I can only sort of show seven components of my data set. And as we know, data is getting larger, uh, multivariate, and so again, we have to think about ways to reduce this data down and show the salient features of our data since we have a limited number of visual variables that we can encode things with. And so the number of visual variables necessary for the representation has to be at least equal to the number of components in the information. And so again, if I have 20 different components of my data in a multivariate data set, there's no way I can represent this on the screen without doing some sort of abstraction or combination of these different variables. Otherwise, um, with three components, for example, the information can be perceived as a single image. So I can map things to X, Y, Z. I can do position, color, and shape, for example. But if I have a whole lot of different variables, I may need several images. So we have a term called small multiples. We're creating different images of the same sort of data, but each image is showing a different sort of component of the multivariate data set. And the number of components is oftentimes the best basis for the classification of your graphic constru um, constructions. So the question might be then, how do I choose an appropriate visual encoding? So I talked to you about how we have seven different visual variables, but how do I decide which sort of data category should go to which one. And so McKinley, in his um, 1986 ACM TOG paper, talked about visual encodings for things. And so we can see here, we've got quantitative, ordinal, and nominal data. And those words should look familiar to Stevenson's categories. And so here in quantitative, he combines ratio and interval together into one sort of category himself. So again, you can think about if you have these different sorts of data types, we now can look at this sort of ideal way to encode these things. And we can see here these different combinations of suggestions of what sorts of things might be encoded for different data types. And the results from that um, wind up in a lot of perceptual studies. So we start looking at the interactions of different things. So again, if I draw a line with a certain length and I want to give that a certain color as well, how do color and length affect my perception? Does one dominate my perceptual channels? And what we find, especially since we're using color a lot, is we need to do a lot of research into how color affects our perception. Um, results for research on visual attention, we can use that to assign visual features to data values. And you can look up Chris Healy's work on perception. I'm going to assume that the perception lecture is going to cover more of these things. But there's certain 
Visual cues will draw your attention to data sets. And one of the key components of visual representing, visual rep, visually representing data is choosing the appropriate color scale. And that's to say there's no best color scale. It really depends on the problem domain and what you're trying to show. And a lot of it depends also on the question that the analyst is going to ask. So you heard um, David talk earlier about how the Coast Guard wanted a green, amber, red stoplight metaphor. That's not uncommon in certain things, um, certain agencies. And you may say, well, I know that there's better visual encodings based on perceptual research. And that may be true, but if that's what the people are used to using in their domain, oftentimes that may be the best metaphor at the end of the day because they understand it already. And so while there's no best choice, there are design principles that we can follow for these sorts of things. And the first design principle for color scheme is order. If we give someone a color scheme for data that is quantitative or ordinal, they should be able to determine some sort of order from the color itself. So if I give you a univariate data type that has some implied ordering, the color um, scale that you choose should also have some perceived ordering. So it should go from light to dark, for example. And then I want to have separation. So we want to have important differences between the colors should be able to be perceptible. So oftentimes you'll see people using a continuous color map, but depending on how continuous that is, you can't tell the difference between different shades of pink unless they're quite far apart in hue, saturation, or brightness. And so again, we'll learn different principles for map design, but oftentimes in cartography, the rule of thumb is simply you'll use seven to nine colors because that's the amount that people can distinguish between. Then the last principle is perhaps the vaguest one where you want aesthetics. You want your color map to be as pleasing as possible while containing a maximum perceptual resolution. So the ordering should also be intuitive. <clears throat> you should have a separation and you should have aesthetics. So there's different sorts of color schemes that you can use in your designs. And one of the most common ones is the rainbow color scheme. But this is a very poor color map choice in a variety of domains. This is very good for nominal data types because there's no implied ordering. So if I give you this color map with no scale and tell you is red bigger than blue or is yellow bigger than green, it just really depends a lot on your cultural background and different people will attribute different sorts of things to the meaning behind these colors. And so here no, no ordering is implied, so we shouldn't be using this for ordered sort of uh, quantitative okay. data. Instead, we can think about using a sequential color scheme where we can see this implied ordering from light to dark or dark to light. And once I label the, the low and the high end, you can see which sort of order it goes. Likewise, um, oftentimes the construct we use is that dark colors represent high, bright, low, and the benefits are this scale is often intuitive. Most people recognize that there's some implied ordering in the light colors to the dark colors. But the weakness is that there's a limited number of distinguishable colors. So again, we go back to this idea in cartography where seven to nine colors seems to be sort of the optimal choice of what people can distinguish between. And there's other also, um, sorts of fun perceptual challenges that wind up in things like grayscale. If I were to take this grayscale and not have the boxes between the colors, you would start seeing what's called mock banding, where it would look like each box would go from a bright color to a lighter color, even though there's no distinct difference in between each sort of chunk. And so those are fun things to look up and you wind up with all sorts of fun little perceptual things you have to think about too. And then if we have some sort of ratio data like we talked about a given zero point or even if you have an analysis where you want to find the difference above or below a certain value then you might start thinking about combining two different sequential color schemes into a <coughs> divergent color scheme where the zero point or the point of interest will be the white and then you would go above or below that value. And here again, the scale may lack a natural ordering of colors. Again, some people may attribute red to being high and blue to being low. So again, you need to think about your labels. But the zero point seems pretty obvious there that we're going towards a certain value. So you're above or below that portion. And so you need to be making careful choices for the high and low ends. And oftentimes we use a concept of cool for blues and warms for reds. So cool will be lower and warms will be higher. But again, part of that comes from our cultural bias and background. A good place to start looking into more of these color design choices, if you saw, um, again, for all the people that are looking at this, this is going to be a lot of information presented in two hours. And so really the goal of this talk is to give you some background on all of these topics, and then you can go and check out all of these papers 
um, if you're interested in a particular topic and learning more. But for color schemes precisely, you can go to Harrow and Brewer's work at colorbrewer.org, and you'll see all sorts of different color maps you can download. They have colorblind choices as well, and all sorts of different cues. You can also think about not just a univariate color scheme, but a multivariate color scheme as well. And so again, we're combining sorts of those um, sequential color maps now along the X and Y axis and allowing people to then interpolate between those colors to find different values. And we combine them in sort of a three-dimensional, <coughs> three-axis color map as well, too. Part of the problem here is, again, interpretation by the end user. Once we get past this sort of one-dimensional color scheme, people have a hard time trying to figure out the changes in data values with these sorts of <coughs> higher-dimensional color maps. Now, that's not to say that you can't use them. It's just oftentimes it'll require a little bit more training by your end users or a little bit more thought process to figure out exactly what color maps to what areas on your sort of chart here. So we talked about color maps, but with all these visual variables, there's been lots of perceptual work trying to order which ones might be the most important. And <coughs> Cleveland evaluated some of these elements in isolation to decide which ones might be the easiest for users to distinguish between different values. And so particularly, he rated them as being the best was the position along a common scale, so people are very good at determining <coughs> distance between items if they're on a common scale or along non-aligned scales. He found length to be the next, angle, area, volume, and then color wound up actually being the worst in terms of people's ability to perceive differences there. Um, tasks here were restricted to magnitude and ratio comparison, so it's simply comparing is this bigger than the other. If you take a psychophysics class, for example, you may learn about up-down tests and those sorts of things for how he would have performed some of these experiments. <clears throat> um, but his research indicated this hierarchy may be best in pre-attentive um, pre stages or when only focusing on a portion of the graphic. And again, in visual analytics, we're confounding this problem even more by adding interaction and other sorts of things there. And so that goes into what if I combine these encodings. So here we talked about he evaluated these elements in isolation. So he looked at position, he looked at length, but those weren't combined together. So what happens now if I encode length and color together? Is that better than encoding, say, length versus size together? And if I represent one quantitative dimension with color and another with orientation, can I expect the perceiver to respond to both dimensions? Or does one dimension dominate and they just sort of blank out the other dimension and don't realize it's there at all? And we need to start looking, do these things make psychological sense? And I know um, Ron Resnick at UBC has been looking at some of these recently and scatter plots and other things, so there's another good source of places to go. And again, I'd recommend um, Lee Wilkinson's The Grammar of Graphics, where he talks a lot about these different sorts of encodings. And so this goes back to sort of graphic design principles and things, where we want to figure out what's going to work and why perceptually. And what happens is we get these sort of integral versus separable dimensions. And so we have a configuration of properties, and we need to express these as some form of interaction between the two properties. So how does color and angle interact? Or how does color and length? Or how does length and angle interact? Um, and so what happens is that we have different combinations produce different dimensionalities. So integral dimensions wind up being not as easily decomposable by perceivers as separable dimensions. So if I have two variables that I can easily separate as a user, I would consider those separable dimensions. If I have integral dimensions, then those are harder. So an example of a separable dimension would probably be color plus length, but the integral dimension would probably be length plus angle. It becomes harder to perceive the differences as you're trying to get those as they're rotated. Um, another example is separating hue from brightness in a color. Those are hard to distinguish, but size and texture are pretty separable for a user. So we have our data categories of quantitative, um, <clears throat> nominal, ordinal, and we want to figure out the best encodings from the exponential number of possibilities. So if we have um, eight visual variables and we have n plus one dimensions of our data, we wind up with an n plus one to the eighth possible encodings of our data. And we want to figure out some sort of principles for picking out these different dimensions. And so one of the principles suggested was the principle of consistency. So properties of the image should match the properties of the data. And then we have the principle of importance ordering, where we want to encode the most important information in the most effective way. So we want to think about what sort of property in our 
visualization is going to be the most effective, what's going to draw the most attention, and we should probably figure out which variable then is the most important and encode that variable to that visual dimension. And we see based on how we encode these things, we wind up implying things that we might not want to imply. So there's always a nice panel at the Viz conference on how to lie with visualization. And I think Brian was talking about this a little bit yesterday where you need to measure the visual fidelity of your images too. Um, can we trust the images that we make? So here I'm showing you a bar chart of cars. And you may implicitly have some idea that the length of the bar is implying some car is better than another. But in this case, the x-axis is simply what country the car is from. And so by using this visual encoding, I'm sort of implying something that's not really there. All I'm implying here is that the VW Dasher came from Germany, not that the Volvo is more important than that. So this is a poor visual representation in terms of what I'm trying to show you. A better one might be plotting points in those things to show that these are sorts of, the US have these sort of cars and these ones. And again, this may still not be the best visual encoding for this sort of data. And so you need to think about what you're trying to show people and what your resultant visualization is actually going to imply to someone else about the data. Again, oftentimes you'll go to your lab and design these um, offline for a while and come back and it may make no sense to other people. So getting feedback and working directly with end users can help alleviate a lot of these concerns as well. But thinking about what you're doing and what these sorts of visual encodings are <coughs> implying is very important. And you can look more about this in Jock McKinley's um, Automating the Design of Graphical Presentations. These two pictures I showed came from his work there. So we've been talking a lot about how we only have about eight visual variables for encoding. But we've also have been talking about how we have this data deluge and we're getting all these sorts of multivariate dimensions of the data. And so we have this sort of curse of dimensionality, which is a term coined by Bellman in 61. And what this is referring to is the problem of multivariate data analysis. So as the dimensionality increases, we get a lot of sparse data in certain dimensions. So data may be clustered along one certain <laughs> value of our data. And we have very um, limited measurements among <coughs> particular values. And the problem is sparsity is a problem for methods that require statistical significance. So if I want to figure out what are statistically significant components of my data set, I need to think about ways to evaluate these. And this goes back again to the visual analytics pipeline. We have the visualization, but underlying the visualization, we want to combine automated analyses to help us figure out what's important within the data set. We don't want visual analytics to just be hunt and peck necessarily for data exploration. We want to see if we can combine this with things that can intelligently help guide us to the important and salient features of the data. Um, and sometimes data dimensions are redundant. We can reduce them with minimal information loss. And so how do we do that? Can I, if I have 10 variables in my data set, can I reduce them to three and make a reasonable sort of image of that data? And again, as we said, in visualization, we're also limited in screen space and the number of visual variables. So choosing the most salient dimensions of our data becomes very important, or how do we aggregate these data dimensions together? So what can we do? Well, again, if we go back to the information visualization mantra, what the idea there was, we do overview first, zoom and filter, details on demand. In the visual analytics pipeline, instead we would do analysis first and try to figure out what sort of things are important in the data set. We could also look at um, having the human in the loop where we're incorporating their prior knowledge of the data. So the human analyst might be able to tell us these sorts of dimensions in the data are most important to me to analyze. We can smooth target functions and then we can reduce the dimensionality. So for a given sample size, there's going to be a maximum number of features above which the performance of classifying samples will degrade. <laughs> what that means is that at some point in time, I'm going to try to say, okay, can I create a model of your high dimensional data set and if I give you a new piece of information, can I tell where that's going to fit in what cluster of your data? And there's a certain number of features that I would need before I can tell which sort of cluster that would go in. And at some point in time, I won't need any more features to get a reasonably good guess at where this new piece of information would go. And in most cases, um, additional information that's lost when discarding some features is compensated by a more accurate lower dimensional mapping. And that's what we really want for a visualization. We want to see if we can reduce this data down to its most salient features at a lower dimensions because the lower dimensions we have means we can visualize this um, with less visual variables in an easier sort of manner. 
And so visualization, what this is also implying though, is that some features of the data set are more important than others. And so this goes back to our principles that we talked about earlier, our principle of encoding, where we want to encode the most important features with the most salient visual aspect. So if we have a, if we have a data dimension that's going to contain more information than others, we should encode that with the sort of thing that's going to draw the most attention to people. And so some of the easiest techniques um, wind up being dimensional reduction. So we have two approaches that are available to reduce dimensionality, is feature extraction and feature selection. So in feature extraction, we can create a subset of new features simply by doing a combination of existing features. And in feature selection, we just choose a subset of all the features in our data set. And so again, given a particular feature space, we can find a mapping of our data from Rn to Rm, where M is going to be less than N, so we've reduced our dimensionality of our data set. And we're preserving the information structure of the original data in the reduced map. But by having this reduction of data, now we have less variables and we can pick more important ones for our visual encoding. And an optimal mapping is one that's not going to increase the error of this um, mapping. And so one of the most commonly applied dimensionality reduction techniques is principal component analysis. And this has been very popular in the visual analytics and visualization community because it's <coughs> relatively straightforward and there's quite a lot of libraries out there. Um, if you go to the GNU Scientific Library, GSL, you'll find implementations of these sorts of things. MATLAB, R, all these different programs have <coughs> some sort of flavor of principal component analysis. And what this is, is a deterministic analytical procedure that utilizes orthogonal transformations to reduce a set of sample observations. So what all that jargon means is basically I'm trying to take all your columns, so if you imagine your data in a CSV file and each column of your data is some measured component. I want to find the correlations between those columns for each observation of your data. And based on those correlations, I can combine them together into some sort of feature direction. And the number of principal components is simply going to be less than or equal to the original number of variables in your sample set. So for some reason, each variable in your sample set was independent of the other ones. There was no correlation. Then you would wind up with your principal components being the same as your original data. But if we have correlation between the data, so if I can use one variable to describe another one based on their correlative relationships, I can reduce those down to a single description of the correlation between them. Um, the main limit of PCA is it doesn't consider class separability, and it doesn't take into account class label of a feature vector. And what I mean by class label is if you're given <clears throat> some sort of data set, you may also have had someone go in and describe different properties of this data set and provide them with different labels, saying that this particular element belongs to class one, this belongs to class two. PCA will ignore that. It doesn't care what you said belongs to what class. It's looking for the correlations between those. It's simply performing a coordinate <laughs> rotation that's going to align the transformed axes with the directions of maximum variance. And what we can assume then is that maximum variance, or what this assumes is that maximum variance contains the most sort of information about the data. And now that may or may not be what you want to show, but again, by understanding both the analysis that it's doing for the dimensional reduction, then you can think about what the appropriate sort of visualization and visual encoding is going to be. And there's no guarantee that the directions of maximum variant is, variance is going to contain the most interesting or important features, but this is often a good place to start. Again, if we have hundreds and hundreds of variables, we need to figure out where we can start looking at the data to find important and salient features. Along with principal component analysis, the other common sort of analytic technique prior to visualizing data is k-means clustering. And what we do here is we take our data, and we have n samples, and we want to partition those n samples into k different clusters as a way of describing those. And then we may project those clusters down into some sort of subset of feature space to see who belongs to what sort of elements of our data. The benefit of k-means clustering is it's very easy to encode. Again, you can find this in the GNU Scientific Library. You can find hundreds of different flavors of this programming online. The drawbacks are that it's going to use a Euclidean distance metric. So in high dimensional space, it's simply going to find the distance between <coughs> element A and element B based on the distance between all of its multivariate components. And that might not be the best distance metric. And again, if you have different sorts of 
properties of your data. So for example, if my element A has both categorical, numerical, ordinal sorts of data, a Euclidean metric may not be the best. I may want to think of other sorts of metrics for grouping this. Likewise, too, this is also <laughs> indicating that I have some prior knowledge of how many clusters will be in the data. I need to know how many K is and tell it how many clusters to find. It will always find the number of clusters I tell it to, regardless of if there's five clusters or if those clusters should have been combined together or if they should have been split. Um, but what's interesting is that the relaxed solution of k-means clustering is given by the principal components, and the PCA subspace spans the principal directions is identical to the cluster centroid subspace. So again, these sorts of analyses go hand in hand. And you can look up some papers that prove this um, last statement that I'm talking about. But again, when we're talking about dimensional reduction, PCA, and k-means, those are sort of the ground level analytical data mining tools that you should have in your belt when starting in your um, visualization work. And so how would k-means work in our examples of healthcare data? Each person in Indiana goes to a particular location on the map. And then I can break my map down into little, little tiny squares. And each square, then I can say, OK, each square of my map is an element. And now each of these dots up here is a square of my map. And I want to cl cluster those squares based on their underlying property. So each square had some number of gastrointestinal disease, neurological disease, and respiratory disease. I can cluster those in my multivariate feature space and project back down to my map to see how those relate in geographic space. So now I know that the purple was all one cluster in this space, but I can see how it's spread out on my map. And so I can look for correlations in my multivariate space and my geographic space. And so we can try all sorts of different visualization techniques that utilize these underlying analyses to help <laughs> group the different data sets. So, we want to know what analysis techniques are going to be effective, and we want to use those to sometimes inform our visual encodings to pick which parts of the data are the most important and the most salient. And then we want to know how to best create images of the data effectively in order to facilitate our analysis. And what we mean by facilitate analysis is often certain questions or certain things that people are doing with their data. Um, one of the first things that visualization is quite good at is helping people spot outliers. So what sort of my, <laughs> if I have a data set and I can look at my data set and let's say I've drawn a scatter plot and my data seems to follow a trend, but I've got one point that's way over here somewhere, that's often quite easy to spot. I can also discriminate clusters. <laughs> um, people are very good at sort of finding cluster patterns within um, scatter plots and those sorts of things. I may also want to check my distribution assumptions. I want to examine relationships between different points of data. I may want to compare the mean and differences. So I want to know which group is bigger than the other, how much bigger, those sorts of things. And then I also may want to observe time-based processes. And so if you think about these sorts of six things that I've talked about here, and think back to what David talked about earlier with a lot of um, the tools that we've developed, a lot of times what people are looking for is well, let's spot the outlier. Let's spot the location on the map where there's more prime or more health problems than we expected. Discriminate the clusters. So can you find a different cluster on the map than we expect? Check the distribution and other assumptions we haven't talked too much about, but that's going on underlined in the analytics. Examine the relationships between different spots on the map or different data values. Then compare the different means on the map and then observe the time-based processes. And again, this is going back to those examples, but you can imagine in all sorts of application areas, you're going to be answering these sorts of different questions about your data. And so there's two main ways then of presenting multivariate data sets. We can do it directly. I can give you a whole bunch of textual tables, or I can do it symbolic, <clears throat> symbolically with pictures. And so you need to decide which of these to use and when. And oftentimes, this depends on the person and the problem set, and maybe I can assume Brian's going to talk about personality factors, which probably plays in, yeah, no, uh, a little bit. So that might play into this as well as what a person might prefer to use. So one case and I, when I might want to use tables is when I want to look at individual values. So when it's very important for me to know a precise value of my data, I may want to present this textually so I can compare that exactly. In the visual representations, like I said, oftentimes we're showing you colors and you're sort of making an inference about what value that color represents, but you're making a guess as to that. Here, if I want to look at the exact value, I may want to use a table. 
If I need to compare individual values, again, quite precisely, I would use a table. And if I have quantitative information that requires more than one unit of measure. And I might want to use graphs when I'm interested in conveying the shape of something, the changes and the trends, and if I want to convey relationships between two variables. So a graph is going to be a visual display that illustrates one or more relationships among entities. And it's simply a shorthand way to present information. So again, you can think of this as drawing a time series plot. Um, you're conveying sort of the trends, the ebbs and flows, and the changes over time. And this is a shorthand notation for us to look at those sorts of changes. And again, this allows a trend and pattern to be easily compared and understood. So I can think about drawing two time series plots next to each other, and I can see which ones grow and shrink and see if there's any sorts of relationships between those. But with these sorts of <coughs> visualizations, it's critical to remain task-centric. So you need to ask yourself a question, why do I need this graph? What is this graph doing? How is it benefiting the questions being asked? Um, what questions are being answered by this graph? And what data is needed to answer those questions? And who's the audience of this graph intended to be? So again, you shouldn't be making a visualization just for the fun of making it. You should think about exactly what questions this is answering and what tasks. And it may be helping an exploratory task, and that's fine. But again, you should think about what sort of questions this can answer <clears throat> for your data. So, one of the first sort of first look tools in visualizing your data is a histogram. And what the histogram is doing is going to show you the shape of the distribution of your data. And oftentimes, the histogram will also be very good at helping you look at outliers or understanding if there's problems in your data set. So for example, if all of a sudden I'm looking at a distribution of latitude and longitude values in my data and I keep seeing my histogram bin having a whole lot of values at zero, maybe that's indicating that some values were misreported. Now the problem with histograms is that I need to make a choice of the bin width and how many bins I'm going to have. And those choices are going to greatly impact the resultant visualization. Just like in color scales where there was no best color scale choice, there is no best bin numbers choice for histograms. Instead, different bin sizes reveal different features about the data. And there's lots of methods and lots of work that's been done in figuring out what's the optimal number of bins. But a lot of these methods make underlying assumptions on the data distribution. So simple histogram binning choices. Again, we want to figure out the number of bins is k. And we can. Specify k as a user, so think about k means we're simply specifying how to group these into k bins. Or we can suggest a chosen bin width h. So if I've suggested how wide my bins should be, I can solve for k. So I'll find the max of my data range in x and the minimum of my data range in x, and I'll figure out the k number of bins. Or vice versa, if the user tells me how many k bins, I can solve for h. A common choice for k is going to include this um, square root choice, where you simply say my number of bins is equal to the square root of the number of samples. So if I've got 1,000 samples, I take the square root of 1,000, and that's how many bins that I would choose for my histogram. Sturge's formula is very similar to the square root choice, where it uses the log plus 1 of the number of bins. Scott's choice uses a standard deviation metric. So 3.5, you first figure out the standard deviation of your data with, along that um, particular dimension. And then you divide it by the cube root of the number of samples. And the friedman diaconis rule is going to actually use the interquartile range, which is what IQR stands for. And we'll talk about quartiles and quantiles in a minute. But again, what the log and the square root and Scott's choice and even the friedman diaconis rule are doing is they're assuming that the data has some sort of normal distribution underlying it. If the data is not normally distributed, which data in the real world is often not, then those choices may not be the best. So here's a nice example of how bin width is going to affect your different histogram visualization. So in the US, we have baseball, and we collect a lot of statistics for different players. Um, batting average would be how well you are at hitting the baseball, for example. I suppose I'm not good at baseball, so if I describe that poorly, um, let me know. Um, so. Here, I just let the user define the bin width. So I took 20 samples of baseball players from the National League. These would have been the top 20 players. And so I sampled them and plotted their batting average as a histogram. And so for each player, I collected the batting average, the number of times they were at bat, the runs batted in. So I have a multivariate data set. And this is just one variable within the multivariate data set. So I'm looking at the distribution of batting average. And you can see 
By taking the square root choice, I get a different look of my distribution. And by doing Sturge's formula, again, I get three bins instead of four. And so I get different sorts of visual representations of the data. So again, by having the user define the bin width, I can see sorts of these valleys. And I can see maybe this has two peaks, but maybe I've over sampled my bin width. Because here I, I see this sort of lower half shape bell curve here with the batting average. And so again, the drawbacks here is that the density estimate that my histogram is performing depends on both the starting position of the bins and the bin size. What I mean by starting position of the bin is in these data sets, I also had to choose where the left and right position of my bin was going to start at in the data set as well. So oftentimes you'll just choose the leftmost position of a bin to be where the lowest value of your data set was. You don't have to do that though. You can decide that you want your bins to be positioned about particular key values that you may have some interest in as the analyst. Likewise, there's discontinuities of the estimate. Um, and these might not be due to the underlying density. It may be due to artifacts of the chosen bin location. Um, and as the number of dimensions grow, you're going to need many samples or else the bins are going to look empty. So again, we get back to the curse of dimensionality where certain variables have a very sort of sparse distribution. And what histograms are suited for best are quick visualizations in one or two dimensions. And so again, this is a good first look sort of visualization tool that is often very handy for people. They often understand these quite well. But again, when we get past two dimensions, histograms quickly become um, cumbersome. We need small multiples and other sorts of things. So histograms, as I mentioned, are a way of estimating data. We can also apply more advanced statistical methods to estimate the data. We can do things like kernel density estimation, which is a non-parametric way of analyzing the probability density function of a random variable. So essentially, the histogram is giving me a probability distribution of my variable based on a very coarse binning of the data. And kernel density estimation is going to smooth this <coughs> um, distribution out and try to estimate different just um, different probabilities of my data at a continuous resolution. Um, here, n is going to be the number of samples. H is going to be the exact same thing as it was for histogram. H is your chosen bin width. And so your histogram is just a particular version of kernel density estimation where you're using, instead of this k function, you're just using a um, square sort of kernel. Here, what K is, is our kernel. Oftentimes, it'll be a Gaussian kernel, so you're smoothing this out in some sort of Gaussian shape. And the problem, again, choosing that H value is going to be crucial. It's analogous to choosing the bin width in histograms. A large H is going to oversmooth the density, and a small H is going to yield spiky estimation. So what I mean by this is the green points you're seeing here are my sample points. The red curve you're seeing for these sample points is my kernel density bandwidth. So that red curve you're seeing there corresponds to this k of whatever part of that equation there. And as I combine those curves together, I get this overlying blue line, which is my density estimate in one dimension. So again, you can think of this blue line as now my smooth histogram in one dimension. And so based on how I've chosen the width of these red bandwidths, I get different resultant pictures of my data similar to how I would for my histogram. So again, this is somewhat of a subjective choice. You might plot out several density estimates with different H values, and you may choose the one that matches your underlying assumption. Um, you may reference it to a standard distribution. So you could assume a Gaussian distribution with H equals 1.06 sigma and to the minus 1 fifth. And this um, tries to reduce error if we assume a normal distribution underlying our data. We may also look for ways to minimize the error between the original data and the resultant density estimation based on some sort of mean squares estimate to figure out the appropriate bandwidth. So there's lots of different methods for choosing these bandwidths, not only in histogram, um, but also in kernel density estimation as well. So we noticed in the earlier slide that we talked about this IQR, which is interquantile range. And so one of the things I noticed that a lot of students haven't had before is an introduction to what quantiles are. 
And what a quantile is, is simply a point taken at a regular interval from the cumulative distribution function of your random variable. So all that's doing is I'm taking my data and I'm dividing it into Q equal size subsets. And the K, Q quantile <coughs> for random variable is going to be your value X, such that the probability for that is less than X at most K over Q. So the second quantile is the median, and the fourth quantile, those are called quartiles. And so we're going to go through an example of what exactly this is. So again, we're back to baseball. These are my 20 people. Each box here is a person. And the number inside the box is the number of times they went up to bat this year. And so let's say we want to figure out the <coughs> quartiles. So again, we're talking about quantiles. Quartiles means I'm going to divide this into four. Okay, if I wanted quintiles, I would divide it into five chunks. And so we want to determine the size of our sample. So n is equal to 20 in our example. So to determine the rank of the quartiles, we first take the number of samples is 20. We divide it by four. So our first quartile is going to contain five samples. What we have to do next is first then we take our data and we order the data. So you notice I've rearranged my elements here, so I've ordered them from lowest number of at-bats to highest number of at-bats. Our first quartile value was 20 divided by 4, so that's our first five samples become our first quartile. And that's the rank in the population from the least to the greatest at which approximately one-fourth of the values are less than the value of the first quartile. So again, if 20 over 4 is 5, then I go take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 517. So if I would say my first quartile is 518, I can guarantee you that five samples are less than 518 in my data set. Now, I said 518 and not 517, and part of the reason is our first quantile, our first quartile rank was 5. 5 is an integer, so you actually need to average the fifth and sixth value in our ordered data to figure out where the quartile should be. Now there's lots and lots of methods for figuring out quartiles. This is the easiest way to do it by hand. If you want to go into R, they have all sorts of ways to figure out the exact value. They all, they all break down into this, that you order your data and you find the position in your data where the data is going to be less than that. But then the exact value of the quartile itself is based on a lot of different calculations. To do it by hand, it's simplest to do it this way I've described. If you put this data set into R, you, and depending on what sort of parameter choices you chose, you might get different quart, um, quantile ranges. So if I had my first quartile to be 521, then I can expect that five values in my data set are going to be less than 521. So I expect that approximately one-fourth of my data will be less than that. So note that actually any value between 517 and 525 can be taken as your first quartile. Now, what quantiles are useful for is, again, in doing a first look at our data set. They're less susceptible to long-tail distributions and outliers. So if the data is not distributed according to an assumed distribution, then the quantiles may be more descriptive statistics um, than the means or other related moment statistics. And the quantiles of a random variable are preserved under increasing transformations. We'll talk about data transformations in a little bit. And we can also use quantiles where we um, only have ordinal data. So we don't just need ratio and interval data. We can also use quantiles in ordinal data as well, which is quite nice. If you're thinking about things like surveys and you're ordering things and you're giving answers such as preferred, strongly preferred, etc., you can use quantiles for distributing that. And one of the most convenient ways of <clears throat> then drawing quantiles is through the box and whisker plots. And what this is doing is it's going to display differences between populations, and it makes no assumptions of the underlying statistical distribution. So these are non-parametric, and the space in between the different parts of the box can help us indicate the degree of dispersion, basically how spread out your data is for these samples. And so here is a single box and whisker plot, and we're going to use quartiles to create the box and whisker plot. So the median is the second quartile. So you figure out the first quartile, and to go through that again, the first quartile was 20 over 4. The second quartile is going to be 20 times 2 over 4, because you're now at the second quartile. The third quartile would be 20 times 3 over 4. And that's the number of samples that have to be less than that value. And so the second quartile winds up being the median of your data. <coughs> the lower quartile, quartile 1, becomes the bottom edge of the box and the upper quartile becomes the top edge of the box, and oftentimes we'll plot the lowest value of the data 
and the highest value of the data to be the whiskers. And then we call this IQR is the length of that box. It's simply the Q3 minus Q1. So you kept seeing that IQR notation earlier. This is how you would figure out the IQR value. An alternate form of the box and whisker plots is that I can use the whiskers to represent different alternatives. So instead of simply plotting the lowest extremas, I could do things like plotting um, one and a half interquartiles of the lower quartile and the upper quartile, and then I can plot little x's below there indicating that there's outliers. Or I can do something like the ninth percentile and second percentile. And then any data, like I said, not included within the whiskers, I plot as a glyph, a star, a circle, etc., indicating that there's outliers in my data set. And again, I can also think about other mappings. I've only used sort of the position of these lines to map things. The width of the box could also be mapped to other data variables. And so I can map the width of the box to the size of the group. Um, one convention is to make the width proportional to the square root of the group size. I can also do a notched box plot, where the notches of the two boxes, um, if I'm comparing two groups next to each other, I can compare the notches, and if they overlap, that may indicate some other statistical properties. And so again, let's go back to our baseball players and we're looking at their batting average. So I split them into two groups now. I took group A had players 1 through 10 and group B had players 11 through 20. And I want to see the difference in batting averages between these two groups. And so I do a box plot for the two groups. I see that the median of group A is much higher than that of group B. Um, but I see that the group A has a quite higher spreadness. So the data range for group A is spread out from all the way down at a batting average of 40. That shouldn't be batting average. It should be runs batted in. I'm sorry. This is the wrong data set. So this is runs batted in. So group A had a runs batted in a 40 and a maximum 120. Group B was somewhere around 50 and 110. But we see that the median value for group B had much less runs batted in than group A. But group A was <coughs> top heavy weighted towards the highest, but they had quite a few members here still at the lower end. All right. Was there, Simon, what time's the next break? Is it still another half an hour? I was just trying to decide when was a... Okay, great. All right, so those were <coughs> sorts of univariate representations of data distributions. And so what we want to think about next is now we talked about how we can encode the width of the box to map to a different proportion of the data set. We can also think about taking other elements of these single variate, univariate statistical graphics and mapping them to be multivariate. And one case is taking histogram, but instead mapping them as a stacked bar graph. So I can still do a histogram of my runs batted in, but now I can take each little chunk of my histogram and I can label it with a person's name. So I can see what player fell into what sort of histogram bin in my data. Now, the question would be, what happens when my data gets very large? I can't do this anymore. You can see how much screen space this took up to allow me to be able to write people's names in boxes so that they're still legible. If I have a whole lot of different names within my data set, this sort of method is not going to work. But what you could do is you could allow for user interaction. So I could hover over a different portion of my stacked bar graph and see people's names or see secondary distributions of characteristics. And so that's how I can bring interaction into this to allow me to start seeing multivariate data sets. Um, another very common statistical graphic <coughs> for bivariate data is the scatter plot. And the scatter plot is simply visualizing discrete data along two axes. And this is a means of analyzing bivariate relationships. So again, we'll get the number of runs and the batting average, and we can see some sort of distribution here. We may look for outliers, and we see that this person has a very low number of runs, but a very high batting average. And so again, you may be able to start questioning your data about why different things are occurring. And scatter plots are a quick tool to assess outliers, clusters, and distributions. And oftentimes, you'll fit a line through your data to try to determine sort of the trends of your data distribution. Now the problem is by putting that trend line through your data, it may also mislead users too. Time series visualizations, we looked at histograms earlier, and we can think of time series visualizations and line graphs as sort of, sort of histograms, except now we're just simply plotting each interval as a point. 
Um, here in this case, we'll plot the x-axis as some increment of time. So here I'm looking at Coast Guard search and rescue missions by day. Um, but depending on the binning used, different temporal data patterns can emerge. So here I'm seeing these very noisy sort of weekly patterns over the summer. And when I aggregate my data, I lose some of this <coughs> weekly noise, but instead I see these um, higher peaks in the summer. I would guess this one is probably Memorial Day, and this winds up being Fourth of July, Labor Day weekend, and then we um, cruise off into the end of summer, and the data starts going down. But again, based on the different sort of binning that we use, different temporal data patterns can emerge. Along with those properties we've talked about, about binning the data, we also need to consider the non-data components of the graph. So here, when I was pointing out things like Labor Day and Memorial Day, all you can do is trust me, because I don't have any time label on the x-axis. So in fact, this is a very poor sort of visual representation, because you can't read anything from this. All you have to do is take my word for when things are happening here. So the main component we need to think of that has really not a lot to do with the data analysis, but has a lot to do with how we can interpret the graphic, is these non-data components where we need axes and legends. And these are often as important, if not more important, than the data themselves. They're allowing us to interpret and understand what's going on in the data. Poor axis choices and labels um, lead to confusing visualizations. So if I have a bunch of overplotting, overlap labels and things that I can't read, it will make it difficult to interpret things. I also need to put tick marks on these axes. So how do I decide where the tick marks should go? Should I put a tick mark at every one unit? What if I have a really long axis? Or what if I don't have units in an order of one? How do I decide that? Um, the ticks need to provide some cognitive context. And they're the most important part for these plots. Um, they're going to support our estimation of the data. And they're going to contribute to the overall appearance of the graphic as well. Remember, we talked about how the graphics need to have some sort of aesthetics and look nice to the end user in order to gain their gar garner their attention and get them to use these to begin with. So again, these are very important. Um, Cleveland, in his work, suggested choosing the scales so that the data rectangle fills up as much of the scale line rectangle as possible. Um, and recently we had Talbot, Lynn, and Panrahan, <laughs> Panrahan, Hanrahan, Pat Hanrahan, <coughs> Um, designed an extension of Wilkinson's algorithm for positioning tick labels on the axes. And so this newest tick label would represent some of the more state-of-the-art in information visualization of where to put these tick labels. And that's actually available in C++ and R. Is it in C++? I believe it's only in Java. I'm sorry, it's in Java and R. And you can get that off of Justin Talbot's website already. So you can start taking advantage of some of these algorithms that are already designed. But again, it's you need to think about where these are coming from. And if you go and read his paper, he'll talk about all the different design elements about where to place tick labels in your graphs. Along with tick labels, we also need to think about aspect ratio. We have a limited screen space for our data sets. So how do I decide the width and height of a graphic? So for example, here we go back to these time series plots. And here we see I have a very long <clears throat> time series plot with a skinny height. And here I have a higher height, but a skinnier time series. How do I decide the particular aspect ratio of these values? And the aspect ratio greatly influences our ability to perceive trends and patterns in a given display. Um, the aspect ratio is going to affect the densities, relative distances, and the orientations that we're able to perceive from these graphics. And there's been a lot of different methods that are proposed for automatically selecting the aspect ratio, particularly over the last about three years in the information visualization conference, there's been two papers following up on Bill Cleveland's work on this. So we can define the aspect ratio as width over height. <clears throat> and Cleveland suggested that we want to try to define the aspect ratio such that it's going to force the different line segments in our time series plot to have an average banking of 45 degrees. And so you can go again, take a look at some of those. Um, more recent work, again, by Talbot and Hanrahan suggests that maybe one arc length based aspect ratio selection. And so they select other metrics to optimize within this sort of aspect ratio. So we look at other properties of the data and how we should sort of maximize these properties in order to decide an aspect ratio. So again, in creating these sorts of graphics, we don't only want to think about answering questions. We also want to think about how the presentation is going to affect our ability to interpret the data. 
So in creating these sorts of statistical graphics, you need to think about where you're putting the ticks on the axes labels, how you're labeling the ticks, and how you're setting up the aspect ratio and the graphs to begin with. <clears throat> so I talked a lot about data distributions earlier. I mentioned that the choice for our bin width and our kernel density estimation can be greatly influenced by the underlying data distribution. And so a lot of times what we often do is we'll use the histogram to determine what sort of data distribution we might have. In an ideal world, if I'm really lucky, my data will be distributed in a normal distribution. The benefit of that is that if my data is normally distributed, a lot of things will work out nicely for me. But the way the data is distributed affects not only the way the data should be analyzed, but it also is going to affect the way that we should visualize it. So what we can do is we can think about ways to precondition our data to try to make it fit a more normal distribution. So the normal distribution has a lot of features that make it popular. And you should recognize this sort of equation as the bell curve for normal Gaussian distribution. We can fully characterize normal data with simply two parameters, being the mean and the standard deviation. And then we also know the probability of any value um, by knowing how many standard deviations it is away from the mean. So this gives us a lot of properties about the data that we can automatically know as opposed to having to compute and estimate and make guesses about. And there's a lot of many statistical measures and tests that are well-defined well for the normal distribution that are less well-defined for other types of distributions. The problem is we have to be very careful not to characterize non-normal data as normal. If you're doing sorts of p-tests and different things and those tests that you're performing rely on the underlying assumption of normality, you need to have looked at your data first to guarantee that it fit that assumption. And that's often the case where many people don't look to see if their data fits this normal assumption and just go ahead and use these different tests. One of the things to look at, along with normality, is the skewness of the data. And what that is doing is simply measuring the asymmetry of my probability distribution. So you can think about a skewed data as if you draw the normal distribution, but instead squish it, kind of, and then draw a tail really far out this way. And so it would be skewed to the right or to the left of the data. So it can be positive, negative, or we can have some undefined skewness. Um, negative skewness is simply indicating that the tail on the left side is longer than on the right. Positive skewness indicates the tail on the right is longer than the left. <clears throat> and a zero value would indicate that we have a very normal sort of distribution where both tails are the same length. And so that would be the ideal sort of thing. It doesn't imply um, symmetry necessarily, but it's a good indication that it might be there. So in visualizing skewed data, what we can often um, have occur is that it's going to compress data values into smaller regions. You can imagine this in terms of your scatter plots. I don't think there's a whiteboard in here. But let's say that the majority of my data would fall into the sort of lower left quadrant of a square. And then I have one point of data that's way, way out here somewhere. So it's going to wind up I put this on a screen, it'll compress all that data that's near each other into the lower left quadrant and put that one point of data way far out there as the outlier. And really, I may want to be seeing what's going on and what clusters are forming in that chunk of the majority of my data. And that outlier causes a skewness in my distribution and causes a low, resultant lower visual fidelity. So one way that I can overcome this skewness is I can simply just remove those outliers. I can say, okay, for visualization purposes, let's leave these outliers out for now. I know that they're already problematic. You can also do interactive techniques. You could zoom into a particular part of the graph you're interested in, <clears throat> and you can brush different data to look at features that you're interested in. Um, and this can help for visual analysis, but not always. So if I want to directly compare data sets with different skewnesses, I need to plot those in order to compare them. And if I want to perform statistical analyses, now I have to think about how I can choose an appropriate test for this data that has skewness underlying its properties. One way I can try to get around this, and note that I say try, this will not always work, is I can try to apply a power transformation to my data. And what I mean by that is I'm just going to take all the values in my data set and raise them to some particular power, typically between 0 and 1. And if I'm lucky, it's going to transform my data to fit a normal approximation. And what this transformation will do is it's going to reduce the effects of skewness, random noise, and monotone spread. Now, 
that's very nice and it allows me to have a normal distribution and it allows me to perform more statistical tests. Again, this is assuming that this worked out and that I could find a transformation that would give me a normal distribution. The problem is we talked earlier about axis labels. So if I've taken all my data and taken the square root of it, so if we go back to thinking about runs batted in, now I've taken the square root of runs batted in. I'm showing that on an axis. The square root of a run batted in means what to a person analyzing that? It's very hard to understand, so you need to think about how to transform the data back as well in certain spaces and what sort of labels and axes and things I'm going to have there. So again, a power transformation can be very beneficial. It can also cause problems in the way people are used to looking at their data as well. And I talked about how you wanted to try power transformations. Typically in viz, people will just either try a square root or a log transformation, but we can automatically detect the power transformation that will come to the closest approximation of normal. And you can use um, the Box-Cox power transformation. And what it does is it does a maximum log estimate to determine the correct lambda for the power transformation of your data. And again, this doesn't guarantee that your data is normal. Again, you should plot your data and you need to look at the residuals and all those things. You need to be a data detective to some extent to determine if this resultant power transformation was worth it. So for example, when I'm done, let's say I did all this work and I found that I should take my lambda to be 0.97. Well, 0.97 doesn't really do a whole lot to my data except make the numbers really wonky for the analysts. I might as well have not done anything because the power of 0.97 is approximately 1, and most likely if you took a look at your residuals, it wouldn't have done anything. It would have wound up being the same sort of distribution. The same if I wind up with some sort of negative 1 for that, all it's doing is inverting my data. And so again, you need to think about what these results are actually telling you as opposed to just applying these sorts of automatic things. And this is the same with PCA and k-means and dimensional reduction. As the person looking at this data, you need to think about what these mean in terms of how it's going to affect your visualization representations. Oftentimes, you're going to find that analysts are concerned about data fidelity because you're doing some sort of transformation to their data that they don't understand. So it's very important that you understand so you can explain to them what you're doing or that you're able to transform it back once you found the important features so that you can represent things in an intelligent sort of manner to them. So, what really happens in a power transformation? So. This is Indiana, and what I've done here is I've, I've plotted my data, and I've colored each county, I'm sorry, each census tract in Indiana based on the number of households that have an income above a certain value. So this is, I'm sorry, so this is based simply on household income. So the darker the blue, the more homes make more money in that particular county. So the darker the blue would be the more affluent, richer sorts of census tracts in this region. And this is my particular data set. You see we have a very low number of households here that have a um, large income based on county. And we see this data is skewed to the right. And when we look at a QQ plot, so this is plotting the quantiles versus the quantiles of a normal distribution, I see I get this very curved sort of structure. If my data had fit a normal distribution, this would have fit a straight line structure. So I can apply a Box-Cox power transformation. I can automatically transform this and you notice when I apply that power transformation and replot my data, it comes very close to fitting this normal distribution now. And my QQ plot is very close to being straight. And now when I rebend my data and recolor it, I can get a higher separation between my colors and I can see different areas here. So the circle area is near Purdue University. In our earlier plot, we can sort of make out that we have one census tract that might be dark blue, but we're not seeing a high um, definition between different areas. And when we do this sort of power transformation, we might get an idea now of where the students might live in the sort of lower colored tracks there as opposed to where the professors might live in the higher colored tracks, for example. And so we're able to see these higher level fidelities between our different color ranges. And so doing this can help me improve the fidelity of my visual encodings and visual mappings. I probably should have had this earlier, <clears throat> but those are some of the sorts of statistical methods we can use to improve visual encodings and um, visual fidelity and to try to help us with our statistical maps. So, if we have multivariate data and we go back to our idea of histograms, what we can do is we can start doing what's called small multiples. So I'm creating different visual representations of a multivariate data set, but I'm using the same visual encoding over and over. So here I have a histogram showing 
the number of people that liked a particular movie. And all of these movies happen to be trilogies here, and each histogram bin here is a particular instance of the movie. So the first bin under Star Wars is Star Wars um, episode five, six, I'm sorry, yeah, five, six, and seven, <coughs> four, five, and six, not the, not the one, two, and three that nobody liked. Um, and so we can think about these small multiples here, and we can look at how Star Wars held up to Indiana Jones, held up to Back to the Future. Now, if we think about this, though, this could have been designed perhaps a little bit better if we had looked at some underlying information about the data. If we think about this, this wasn't necessarily designed by when the movies were released, so we know that The Matrix would have been released before, I'm sorry, after Superman, so I could have ordered these to have some sort of encoding about release date, or I could have thought about ordering these based on how similar they were to other sorts of movies in terms of their score. So in fact, we could have think, thought about taking Back to the Future, since it was quite popular, and moving it up next to Indiana Jones and Star Wars. And so we could start creating sorts of clusters of these multivariate multi analyses and providing some sort of ordering to these small multiples that may give us more information. Or well, while it's not maybe more information, it makes it easier for us to do these comparisons. And then I would wind up saying, OK, the highest rated trilogies would be in the upper left, the lowest rated in the lower right. And I could try setting up some sort of ordering based on some other derived statistical property of my data. <clears throat> other sorts of visual representations would be using tag clouds and wordles. So we can look at visual representations for text data, so where words are placed and scaled based on some statistical measure. And so again, this was popularized around, what, 2002, I believe? Yeah. The early 2000s, this was a popular sort of thing to see on the internet. You would take your document of your website and pick up the keywords and plot those out in this tag cloud. Um, what Wordles would do is it would arrange the words now. We're encoding size into the words. So the size would represent the frequency of the word, as opposed to in tag clouds. Oftentimes it was color and size a little bit, but it just depends. And so we can see again, we go back to those visual encodings of how we combine those together. And we can also think about using redundant encodings too. So we start seeing that the lighter the color here, and the lower word count, the darker the color, the more word count, and the size is also indicating more word count. So we're encoding that sort of property twice into the variable in order to help people see that in a quicker sort of manner. We talked about multivariate case for doing small multiples for histograms. We can also do that same sort of thing for scatter plots, and the term for that would be a scatter plot matrix, where now I'm showing you every dimension of my data set. So earlier I had my at-bats, runs, and batting average for my baseball players. Now I can set that up so that my x-axis is such that um, here I've got at-bats on the x-axis for every column in the top row. I've got runs for the x-axis for the middle column and batting average for the thing here. I must have some axes back. I, the x and y axes are switched here. I'm sorry. That's not exactly how it should be. <clears throat> And the reason we have this straight line down the center here is because we're plotting at-bats versus at-bats, runs versus runs, and batting average versus batting average, for example. And so this allows us to explore all the different combinations of our data. But again, we can imagine as the multivariate plot gets larger, this takes up more space. <clears throat> we need to think about, again, axis labels, <coughs> tick marks. Um, aspect ratio of the different graphs, and those sorts of things as well. Another multivariate technique that goes along with these sorts of scatter plot matrices is parallel coordinate plots. So in a scatter plot matrix, I'm plotting each variable of my data set as an x and y coordinate. In a scatter plot matrix, instead what I'm doing is I'm plotting each variable by data set along a single axis. And so each line represents a particular instance of my data. So you can think of each line as representing a baseball player in that data set. And then I would connect the data together. So if this was runs and this was number of bat, I would connect that player between his two measurements of that point. And so then we look for sorts of clusters and bands of these lines in the parallel coordinate plot to indicate some sort of correlation between the variables. But again, we go back to now thinking about how the ordering of the data is important. 
I can put these axes in any order. I don't have to put variable one here next to variable two. I could have put variable one next to variable five, but then that's going to change my entire picture. So when you're using parallel coordinate plots, oftentimes you'll want to again do an underlying analysis to see what dimensions might be the most correlated or the least correlated and try to figure out how to interactively arrange your data or how to automatically arrange your data to show the best sort of information or the most information to an end user. And so again, we think about how we talked about here, we could have rearranged this data based on some underlying property. Again, we could rearrange our scatter plots based on some underlying property to try to shift the information to the upper left or to the lower right. And the same with the parallel coordinate plots. We can look at some sort of derived information from the variables to try to think about how we might rearrange these for a higher visual fidelity of our data. And so again, issues with parallel coordinate plots are that different variables can take different values with different ranges. So what you have to do first is you have to normalize each of these axes. If we again think about our baseball players, batting average ranged from 0.25 to 0.4, somewhere in that range, but number of at-bats would range from anywhere from the hundreds. So if I plot those, I have quite a different scale between those two. So instead, I'd want to scale these from 0 to 1. And you could also think about power, doing a power transform for each axis to try to have a normal distribution of the data along those as well. Again, like I said, the order of the parallel coordinate plots has a major impact on the resultant visualization. And the more variables we plot, the more lines we're going to get and the more clutter we get. Here you see I've only plotted about five sorts of lines on the graph. Imagine now if I had the same picture, but I plotted 100 different baseball players that all start overlapping and trying to figure out which baseball player is which. One way we can get around that is by clustering different bands together, or we can also add interaction. So again, by brushing over a particular line, it gives me information on who that baseball player is. And so we start improving and enhancing our ability to analyze data by adding these sorts of underlying analytical processes to order the data in some way that makes sense brushing the data to provide more information on interaction, and again, analysis through the user. Similar to parallel coordinate plots, we have star plots. And star plots are just like parallel coordinate plots, except now I've laid out these axes in a radial fashion as opposed to side by side. And what happens is I can then create glyphs to compare different sorts of players to each other, or I could have plotted different lines of all the different players. So again, if I picked one axis to be runs, RBI, batting average, and at-bats, then for Gonzalez, for example, I can draw his star plot glyph, and I can compare that to Vado here, or Infantante, Infante, <laughs> and I can see which player might be more dominant. If you guys have played um, old sorts of video games or Dungeons and Dragons sorts of things, you'd often see these as being sorts of characteristics for your character. You would have some sort of hit points or magic points on each axis, and you see this sort of glyph representing um, some properties of your character. And again, we can look at this as representing some properties of our data to compare different data attributes across different measurements. So the last sort of major statistical graphic I want to talk about before talking about some more advanced analysis is geovisualization. And geovisualization works a lot like histograms that we talked about before. Um, primarily geovisualization, I shouldn't say works like histograms, particularly core plot maps and geovisualization um, have a lot in common with histograms. Geovisualizations are used primarily to denote tools and techniques where we focus on a geographic component. And visual representations are designed built on cartographic principles. So while visualization, um, we showed Earlier, I showed you guys Leonardo da Vinci's flowing water and Jon Snow's cholera map and those sorts of things. Cartography, I think, can be traced back to, um, I believe it's 100 BC or else it's 180, but quite older than we can trace back some of these other sorts of drawings. We have a whole um, long history of these cartographic design principles to build off of. And what we're trying to do is figure out a representation that will help us see trends over space. And then we can think about seeing trends over space and time. So core plot maps are probably the most common sort of map you're going to see. And these are simply areas of the map are shaded in proportion to a measured variable. And then we color these based on a classification of the distribution of the measured variable. 
And what I mean by classification is, again, I take a single variable from my data set and I bin it into histogram. And each of those bins now maps to a color, and then I color the map. So this works exactly like we talked about with histogram binning, except now we typically have a user-defined number of bins, um, seven to nine, because we can only see seven to nine colors on the map. And so you'll hear cartographers and geographers talk about classification as opposed to histogram binning. And so here is a good example of um, acres of hay production in the U.S. in 2002. And we can again start looking for patterns and trends. We see the majority of the hay and alfalfa in the U.S. is growing in the Northwest. We also see this large hay belt sort of here in the Midwest. And we might wonder why that occurs there. And part of that might be cattle routes from Texas to Missouri slaughterhouses. So following the train route from northern Texas to Kansas City, Missouri, for example. And so by having these sorts of maps, we can start looking for spatial correlations that we might be interested in. And again, the number of colors on the map depend on the number of classes. So here we had, um, we had a six color map. So they had broken their data into six different regions, six different histogram bins based on acreage. If we have too many classes, you're going to overwhelm the user and distract them from seeing trends. You can imagine if I had 100 different colors and I'm asking you to differentiate between 100 different colors, it becomes very difficult to see all of those. Um, you may be overwhelmed as your histogram is now showing a lot of the noise in your data set. And too many classes comp uh, compromise the legibility as the colors are difficult to distinguish. Typical cartographic rule is five to seven. And we have our typical coloring schemes again that we talked about earlier is you'll have sequential, divergent, and qualitative. And so for more details on mapping as a visual representation, you should take a look at Alan McEachern's wonderful book on how maps work by the Guilford Press. Along with choropleth maps, we can also have isopleth maps, where these are isorhythmic maps or contour maps. And what we can do here is we can take our point data and we can do density estimation to our data. And again, we can now fit our probability distribution curves to this data and we wind up with this smoother data as opposed to this bin data. And interpolation methods might um, involve kernel density estimation, like we talked about, now extended to two dimensions. We have more advanced methods like Kriging. And then an another one that you're probably familiar with is proportional symbol mapping. So instead of mapping things to colors, we're going to map symbols to variables in our data set. So we're going to represent a numerical data associated with point location to a symbol. And then that symbol is going to be sized, perhaps, and that's where the proportional symbol comes in. It's going to be sized based on its relationship to the numerical data. So for example, here would be a number of microbrew pubs in the US. And the size of the beer mug represents states that have more microbreweries. So we see we have quite a lot of microbreweries in the Northeast and Northwest and Florida, for whatever reason. We have kind of the dry states here with Kentucky and Tennessee have few microbreweries that are at least recorded. Is the area of the glyph mapped to that? So it's not necessarily area of the glyph. And again, mapping area, um, if you go back to Wilkinson's work, so um, area is not always the best perceptual feature to tell the difference between because um, a circle that has twice the area as another circle is hard to tell that it's twice. If you double the radius, it's easier to tell that it's twice the radius, even though that the area is wrong. You can go, I can show you the paper for that. <laughs> so it really depends on what you're trying to show. So the question he asks is, um, how do I size these? Um, is the area twice as much? And you'll see here, it's probably not that the area is twice as much. You're seeing really it winds up being... Um, the radius perceptually here is twice as much, or probably not twice here, it probably winds up being a half or something as much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, and time. the next Sorry. thing I want to talk about is coordinated multiple views. So we had these histograms, we had box um, histograms, box plots, scatter <laughs> plots, parallel coordinate plots. And so the question that if I was you guys that I would want to ask me is, well, how do I know which one to use? Why should I use a parallel coordinate plot over a scatter plot over something else? So instead of trying to make the best visualization for all of our data, a lot of times what we can do is we can make multiple views for the user. So you can look at your data in different ways. And these different sorts of plots might tell us different information about the data, even though it's the same data, it's just viewed and represented in slightly different manners. And by expressing the data in a variety of different ways and making it interactive, we can 
help people gain this information and understanding. And these representations can be linked or coordinated. And so you had Cleveland started to do these sort of brushing scatter plots. You would select a particular set of data in one scatter plot and see how it looked in the other representations of the scatter plot matrix. And you start seeing these combinations and coordinations. And so along with that, <clears throat> with the idea of these um, brushing in multiple views, we have different interaction types. So how do we interact and explore the data? So if you remember back to visual analytics, we talked about how we wanted data analysis coupled, coupled with visualization, coupled with interaction, all this leading to understanding and how the cognitive and perceptual processes play a role in that. So with interaction, we can think about how do we want to highlight and focus on particular parts of our data? How do we want to drill down into the data? Do we want to create hyperlinks? Do we want to create link documents to the data? Um, how about an overview and context of the data? How do I allow people to change the parameters of what I'm visualizing? So can I change from one visual encoding to another? How do I change the parameters in my analysis that's hooked into this as well, too? What if I'm an expert at analysis and I know that maybe I want to modify these sort of variables in the analytics process? Um, how can I do some sort of temporal fusion of my data? If I have multimodal, multi-streaming data sets, can I interactively sort of pull those into the data stream as well? And there's several sorts of things we think about in interacting with the data. One of the most common things might be comparing and sorting the data. So um, that's a very common sort of technique that you're going to want to do is you're going to say, okay, I have this data set, I have another data set, I want to compare them to each other. One way to compare them is, as we saw with quantiles, would you sort the data set, and that allows for different sorts of graphical representations and different knowledge of the data. And we can provide a selection of data graphics to compare values. We can add and filter variables. We can highlight them. We can aggregate data levels together, as we saw by looking at these geographic maps. Um, we can zoom and pan, rescale. Oftentimes, we'll also want to allow for annotation and bookmarking of our data. So if I'm a data analyst and I'm exploring my data, I don't want to get lost in my process. So if I've got this interactive, free-form exploration, if I'm going down one trail and I get interested in something else, can I come back to this point where I branched off? How do I keep track of these different um, analytical threads that I'm having? Um, a, new, a recent program in that is Seesaw from the CANVAC group. Is that the right name of your guys' group? Viva. Viva. Okay, um, yeah. John's lab. John's lab, John Dill's lab. So Seesaw, they're looking at analytic provenance um, and tracking sort of how the analysts might go through their um, exploration. And the real keys, the real, <laughs> the key intent is what the user wants to do. How does the user want to interact with the data? And so we want to focus on what the user wants to achieve based on these interaction techniques. And the interaction is going to be done for a purpose. You're not just going to scribble on the screen with your data, just be like, oh, what's this button click do? What you're doing is you're seeking something. You might be seeking more information. You're trying to solve a problem. And basically, it's exploratory analysis and analytic discourse that the interaction is allowing for. So interaction and visualization, um, Stasco and G Su Yi provide a sort of categorization of interaction and visualization. They break it down into seven categories, talking about selection, exploration, reconfiguring, encoding, abstraction, filtering, and connection. And if you want to look, <coughs> learn, if you want to learn more about their different categories, I would recommend that you take a look at this paper. Um, but that's just basically the idea of the seven different categories of their interaction and visualization. So, We've gotten sort of through a lot of the visualization categories we wanted to talk about. We talked about analytics, visual representations. And so we can think about the visual analysis versus visual analytics. Visual analysis might be simply looking at the representation and analyzing the sorts of visual encodings that we've made. The choice of visual representation is going to influence the user's analysis. And then the visual analytics side would be the interaction with these visualizations, the understanding, the knowledge, discovery, and exploration. <clears throat> what I can do is I can massage the data to help improve the visual representation. To do that, we talked about doing things like power transformations and making sure that we have tick marks and appropriate labels and appropriate dimensional scaling and reduction to find important features. And then if we allow interaction, 
we can help the user form and explore their own hypotheses. So we start moving from this visual analysis where I've just created a single static image of my data to this sort of now interactive process where I've moved towards the visual analytics component. Now the question then is, if I'm having these people analyze this data interactively, is there also a way that I can help them find important features in their data? Even with the interaction, one could argue that it's still just visual analysis if it's just hunting and pecking, if I'm just exploring the data somewhat willy-nilly. Instead, can I have some sort of analytics component that's wrapped into my system that tells me what parts of the data are important that I should be exploring interactively as opposed to my just hunting and pecking based on intuition? <coughs> and so data mining as a domain has techniques for examining data, looking for patterns, looking for anomalies, and we can use this to enhance the visualizations and show us what's important. So we did talk a little bit about data mining at the beginning for dimensional reduction, but now we can talk about data mining more as anomaly detection, so finding interesting things in our data that the user should be wary of. David pointed this out in things like crime analysis or healthcare analysis, where we want to look for hot spots of syndromes, hot spots of crime, and we want to figure out why this is occurring. So why is there an anomaly in the data set in this location at this time? We can also use this to show exploratory analysis. So if I think this particular part of my data set looks interesting, show me the other parts of the data set that looks like this. So we can think about using data mining to ask questions like that as well. So one of the ways to do this is through temporal analysis methods. And for those of you that haven't taken any sort of time series statistical classes, I would highly recommend those. And those aren't often offered through computer science. Or oftentimes um, in statistics, you may check your stat department or your industrial engineering department. But those will provide you with a basis of figuring out how to do what we would call control chart methods. And control charts are <laughs> relatively simple at their baseline idea. And as you take a class, you'll learn better and more advanced methods. But what you'll do for control chart is let's say I have a chunk of temporal data. And let's say I have a measurement of some process every hour, every day, um, whatever time interval I'm given. What I can do is I can take that process and I can find the mean and standard deviation of that process given my available samples. And then I can take a look at my next timestamp, my next time data, this data streaming in, and I compare that new data value to my old data's mean and standard deviation. And if I'm more than a certain number of standard deviations above the expected mean, that means statistically that shouldn't have happened. I expect that my process is going to be controlled and that it's always going to stay within some normal range. And if it's not, then that's an alert. And that's typically how you'll find alerts in um, syndromic surveillance like David showed or in crime analysis too. Um, and the number for the standard deviations, if you use a Schuert chart, he suggested three standard deviations above or below the mean. Hold on, we're getting there. <laughs> I thought. So I'm missing a slide apparently. So the question was, why did Schuert suggest three standard deviations above or below the mean? So if you remember earlier, I talked about how statistical distribution, that we have a normal distribution, this allows us to perform um, some stronger statistical analyses. In a normal distribution, three standard deviations represents approximately the 99% confidence interval. So if I'm three standard deviations above the mean, that means there's a 1%, I'm sorry, 99% of my data should have fallen within three standard deviations of the mean. And so if I'm over three standard deviations, that's the 1% of the data that's an anomaly. So I should go and check what this is. It was a very far outlier from my data. You may use two or two and a half, depending on what your confidence interval range you want to be. If you want 95% um, confidence interval or versus a 99% confidence interval. And again, we would want to think about doing a power transform to our data. If we can make this time series fall into some part of normal distribution, if we can approximate a normal distribution, then the control chart methods will work a lot better because they're anticipating an underlying normal distribution of the data. So did that answer the question about why for three? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a pretty standard sort of temporal analysis method using control charts. And in our earlier slides, David showed things like the um, seasonal trend decomposition with lowest smoothing and those sorts of things. So by taking an advanced time series statistics class, you can sort of have this streaming data set now where you're looking for anomalies as the data is coming in. A lot of our processes are both 
spatially and temporally linked. We have geographic and time, so we want to find anomalies both in space and time. And looking at these sorts of advanced methods for directing attention to anomalies can be very important and helpful as well. Likewise, we can find similarities in time series. So if I have a time series and I say, well, this process is interesting, I see it has several fluctuations that to me indicate something as a key analyst, I may say, well, I want to see other <clears throat> regions in the country or other data elements that have a very similar sort of time series. And this is an indexing problem. So you can imagine in the stock market, if I pick stock X and for whatever reason I think that one um, is following a certain pattern, I may say, well, show me all the other stocks that are following a certain pattern. And what I can do then is I can do things like subsequent similarity, so I can find out other days in which stock X had similar movements as today. Um, I can do clustering, so I can group regions that have similar temporal patterns. And I can do rule discovery, so I can find rules like if X goes up, Y goes up. And these sorts of data analysis um, things are very, very common in day trading and Wall Street and those sorts of places. And it's um, quite interesting how much they rely on these sorts of machine learning algorithms. And we've talked about how people are mining Twitter and social media feeds. Um, you would be foolish to think that the stock market people aren't already taking advantage of all these things. Um, it was a couple years ago when um, the news reports started cycling a story about Chrysler's bankruptcy, um, but the story was 10 years old. It just happened that for whatever reason, Yahoo and Google had wound up bouncing this to the top. Chrysler's stock crashed for about 30 minutes as those algorithms started seeing this bankruptcy story, um, and the day trading automatically started selling off those stocks in bundles, and then half an hour later, it went back to normal. And so again, having an analyst in the loop and having more information about these things, um, you, again, you can't always trust all of our data mining solutions. And this goes back to why we might want this visual analytics process. Uh, likewise, too, with just pure data mining, we go back to our example of crime analysis. Um, one of the things that happened was the, the pure data mining group will say, well, just give me all the data for crime analysts. So I give them all the data, and they come back a week later, and they say, okay, here's our, our key finding is that low-income areas have more burglary. So I know that's very shocking to people, but <laughs> if you go and tell that to a police officer, your key finding of your data mining algorithm, they won't be too surprised by that. And that's the only thing you wind up finding. You find very obvious correlations. What we're trying to find with these sorts of techniques is I'm giving you the haystack, and my haystack is very, very large. It has lots of needles. And so these techniques allow me to then pull out all of the needles and now find the needle that's important in the stack of needles. So this will allow me to find the things that are the same or important, and then I need to use some sort of other techniques or the human in the loop to look at the appropriate needle in the stack of needles that I've found. So. <clears throat> Another way to do this in the spatial temporal domain is what's called the scan statistics. So this part of the talk is where we get to some more sort of advanced um, analytic techniques. And so we've talked about how we can find time series anomalies through control charts. Well, what if I want to find a spatial temporal anomaly? And the idea of scan statistics is that we want to exhaustively scan the search space to, <clears throat> to check for all possible statistically significant clusters. So in control charts, statistical significance meant that I deviated from the normal or the expected. And that's also what we're looking at here, except now I'm wanting to see if the pattern of people in an area deviates from normal. And so I wind up having to do modeling of the data. And the spatial scan statistics um, was preceded by Openshaw, who was here in Britain, um, and was popularized later by Koldorf as a spatial scan statistic. This algorithm and SatScan is freely available at satscan.org. You can download it. You just have to give them your email address. And what it's doing is you're going to give it your data, and your data has some sort of case and control. So in the case of syndromic surveillance, syndromic surveillance is when we had taken the data for everyone that went to an emergency department. And so if I want to look for interesting areas of respiratory illness, what I can do is I can say, okay, everybody that came into the emergency department is a control. I expect that so many people will come to the emergency department every day, and then my cases would be the people with a particular type of illness, and that would be my case that I'm looking at. You could think about this for crime. 
where again, all of my crimes will be the controls, and my case will be a particular type of crime that I'm looking for. And what I'll do is I'll take one of my cases in the data, and I'm going to repeat this process for every case in my data set, and I'm going to draw a circle. And my circle is going to be drawn such that the first radius I pick is going to touch the nearest element. In this case, it wound up touching the three nearest because they were all the same distance away. And then I'm going to keep drawing these circles, touching the next nearest elements, until I've drawn enough circles such that the largest circle contains half of my samples in my data set. So now I have all these different circles. So they're not disappearing. This circle and this circle are still in there, and I'm going to analyze each of these circles in turn. All right, so I'm finding all of the possible windows for this particular case. And then what I do for each window is I'm going to compute the likelihood function. And depending on your data distribution, again, there's different formulas for this. But the easiest one is if we have a Bernoulli distribution, and again, we may take our data and do some sort of transformations. We need to look at our data and see how it looks. But for a Bernoulli distribution, we can use this formula, where lowercase c is the number of cases in the window. So lowercase c is simply count the number of triangles in our circle. Capital C is count everything on the plot. So capital C is just count all the triangles and squares together. Whoops, I'm sorry. Capital C is count all the triangles. I'm sorry. Lowercase n is count all the triangles plus circles in my window. I'm sorry, count all the triangles and squares in the circle. And then capital N is count everything, count all the triangles and squares together. All right? And then I can simply fill in those numbers, and you can say I is going to be an indicator function that winds up um, being 1 would be fine. And the idea is that if the number of cases is more than expected based on the null hypothesis, we'll get I is 1 and 0 otherwise. And so we assume that I is 1 for this. And so I'll take this window and I'll calculate my likelihood function. So this is my original data. I'll use this formula, and I'll get what's called L0. So this is my likelihood for my given data distribution. And now I keep my window in the same spot, but now I take all my data, and I randomly redistribute all my data in my space that I have. And now notice my window hasn't changed, but the things that are inside that window have changed. So now I take that new data distribution and what's inside the window, and I calculate a likelihood for that. And I repeat this process. I keep randomly redistributing my data some m times. And once I have that, I have a whole string of likelihood values for my data. What I'll do is I will sort my likelihood values, and then the location of my original likelihood value in this series is going to give me my p-value. It's simply the sorted position of L0 divided by m, where m is the number of iterations I've done in my simulation. And now this can be extended to spatial temporal situations, where before I talked about how we calculated the window was simply based on doing a continuous circle. In the spatial temporal case, what you're going to do is not only a circle, but then you're going to extend the cylinder into time. You can imagine each of these pictures is now sliced on top of each other as a time step, and you'll grow your cylinder in time as well. And you might also say, well, <clears throat> can this be done in real time? And the answer is no. This is a very, very slow algorithm because it's basically scanning the entire space of your data set. So if you want to do a spatial scan statistic for a reasonably sized data set, um, by reasonably sized, let's say you have 1,000 samples per day, that would probably work. I could probably do a spatial scan statistic of 1,000 samples a day in under 30 seconds. If I want to do a spatial temporal scan of that, it would probably take about a year for your normal laptop to compute that because you're um, basically extending all these cylinders and circles and distributions. So again, if we can go back to the visual analytics process, and if I can say on my maps, well, I think this particular area of the map is strange, then I could do a spatial scan statistic of just that area for my data set and perhaps have a faster way of computing and validating my hypotheses. All right. Sorry, excuse me. Give me an example of how, how do you redistribute your data? When so you would do a Monte Carlo simulation. So you would assume that your data has some sort of underlying distribution, and that's where it goes back to the Bernoulli distribution. And so you would take all of your data in that space and redistribute it as a, Monte, as a Bernoulli function or a, as a, the, 
as a Poisson function. Exactly, and that's the expensive step here is recomputing those Monte Carlo distributions. And so typically you'll do that about 999 times to get a um, nice p-value. And the more times you do it, the more confident you'll be in that. So um, I think the default setting in SCAT SAT scan is 99,999. So it's always something with a 9 because then you add your original <laughs> number to it. And so if I can make M be a nice round number, it makes the p-value divide out nice and easy. So there's no reason why you can't do 5 or 700, but if I do an easy value, it makes it easy to divide the p-value out. So, like I said, all you're doing is keeping the window in the same location, and you're calculating the likelihood function for the new distribution. And you repeat this, and then the benefit of this is you actually get a p-value for your data distribution and as I said, this is related to Openshaw's work in the geographic analysis machine. So to summarize our talk today, since we're about out of time, we can see that visual analytics combines a wide breadth of topics. And I've only covered a very small set of um, things that I've done a lot of. So we've talked about visual encodings, dimensionality reduction, um, data analysis, and a little bit about interaction. But we can also think about, we need to look at perception. We could think about advanced statistics, human-computer interaction, cognition, and many, many more. And this is ignoring, then, the domain speciality, too. We haven't ever talked about domain knowledge and experts in that sort of area and how to bring that information in. So this tutorial is really only glossed over some of the more commonly used methods and functions as an introduction. If you found any of these topics interesting, what I would recommend doing is go back to that particular slide. And on there should be one or two references that are related to the um, most key work from that particular area. What we need to remember is we need to be cognizant of parameters for visual representations. You need appropriate analysis to guide users to interesting features of the data. And you need a refined analysis through user interaction and their domain knowledge to help discover hidden problems. Remember, there's no single catch-all visual representation or analysis. Instead, we want a combination of different things to some extent, we're still playing data detectives, as Tookie described in exploratory data analysis. But visual analytics is helping us move even further along that path by providing us with new tools, new interactions, and those sorts of things that are available. Keys for success, um, having, user, um, and having user and problem-driven research. This will often help you focus your research on real-world problems that are oftentimes complex, noisy, multivariate. We want to balance human cognition and automated analysis and modeling. So having those trade-offs like I talked about with data mining, you sometimes will come up with very obvious solutions and by balancing those with human cognition we can help perhaps guide the data mining. There's been a lot of recent papers in VAST looking at how we can help augment these sorts of data mining techniques based on human knowledge. Um, some good papers there was from Chris North and Alex Endert. We can look at interactivity and easy interaction. So how do we use human computer interaction and novel anal analysis approaches? We also want to see if people can understand if we're doing these predictive models. Do people understand why we predicted what we predicted? Do they understand the error or uncertainty in my predictions as well? Are these intuitive visually? Are they intuitive um, cognitively? Do people understand how to interact with these? And we want to make sure they're not overloaded with features. So we talked about how we can have um, coordinated multiple views and that there's no single catch-all. But again, having too many things can overwhelm the user too. So starting with something simple and building up can often be a key for success. And so we've got a couple minutes left for questions. If you have any particular questions, now's a good time.